Hey everybody, this is part three of Rethinking the Industrial Revolution, five centuries of transition from agrarian to industrial capitalism in England, by Michael Andrew Zmulek. The title of the part is Customs Last Stand, the rise and fall of artisan-led resistance to capitalism in England, 1783 to 1848. First chapter, chapter 10, Custom and Law. Quote, Her memory still is dear to journeymen, for sheltered by her laws, now they resist, Infringements which would else persist, tyrannic masters, innovating fools, are checked and bounded by her glorious rules. Of workmen's rights, she's still a, she's still a guarantee. That's from Rule, nineteen eighty seven. I'm not sure what that's a, uh, yeah. Anyway. In the late 18th century, the saddlers, who had just emerged from a dispute in which they presumably prevailed, composed this, quote, ode to the memory of Queen Elizabeth. The ring of nostalgia and the need to eulogize the statute of apprentices to which it refers are undoubtedly the result of at least a century of case law decisions that had resulted in the scope of five Elizabeth C4. Being considered, I don't know what these, these numbers mean, being considerably narrowed in comparison to how it had been applied in the past. Oh, that's a law. That's what those numbers were. Footnote. Note that 5 Elizabeth C4 is commonly referred to both as the, quote, statute of apprentices and the, quote, statute of artificers and sometimes as the, quote, statute of artificers and apprentices. For our purposes, we shall use the same, quote, statute of apprentices, as this seems to be the most con common usage. End footnote. In the 1790s, cottage manufacturing, which had afforded a relatively comfortable existence for the vast numbers of British people who were displaced from subsistence farming, their numbers rising along with the unprecedented rise in population was reaching its zenith. Yet signs of its coming demise were everywhere. The customary laws that had shielded many peasants and craftsmen from full exposure to the market were coming under full attack in the name of progress. Parliamentary enclosures were reaching their peak, bringing around about the final extinguishing of the customary law of the manor, specifically by dismantling parish by parish the last of the customary courts that had regulated the production relations of the village. Under the banner of, quote, free trade, commerce was increasingly opening up to allow all comers who had the means to take part to enter. Now it was manufacturing's turn. Factories and workhouses were being built apace. Britain's cities and towns were filling up with factory workers, outworkers, and a, quote, reserve army of labor of the poor and unemployed. Crime and policing were set to grow alongside one another. Harsh new laws against theft and vagrancy were directed primarily at the poor, while laws such as five Elizabeth, and the customary social arrangements it enshrined were running up against the new liberal ideology embodied in the recent and increasingly popular writings of the political economists. In this chapter, we will examine the period between the accession of the younger Pitt to the office of Prime Minister in 1783 and Parliament's adoption of the Speenham land system in 1795, with an eye to solving the riddle of why during this period appeals to custom and customary forms of protest became more, not less prominent, a social phenomenon in British social life and politics.
We have already seen how the customary regulation of manufacturers as enshrined in the statute of apprentices was increasingly disregarded by employers throughout the 18th century. With the full repeal of the statute in 1814, it might be expected that this closed the final chapter on customary regulation of production in Britain. But this was not the case. The peculiarity of custom is that while it was reflected or enshrined in laws and statutes, custom goes beyond law. Custom defies simple definition. Custom is rooted in communities, in local culture. It is lex loci. The cultural norms and practices that regulated economic life before capitalism could not simply be legislated out of existence. As the legal framework upon which customary modes of social and economic regulation were founded was dismantled, resistance to the imposition of capitalism in defense of custom persisted and took on new forms. Custom was not merely a, quote, fetter or a, quote, break, on the inevitable development of an already existing market economy. Markets had existed before, but market society had not. Custom regulated both markets and production in pre-capitalist society. The fact that custom comes to the fore just as the legal foundations of customary normative economic regulation are being dismantled underscores the fact that what is being created in capitalism is something entirely new, and that the resistance put up by local communities of laborers and craftsmen was based in the cultural understandings that they shared, having no other precedent upon which to base their response. Those who engaged in forms of resistance to capitalism and industrialization that appealed to custom were not backward, self-interested, and myopic as they have often been portrayed. They were not engaging in resistance against a form of society that already existed. Rather, they resisted efforts to construct a new form of society that had never previously existed. What was strange and unusual was not the way in which laborers, quote, fell back, end quote, on appeals to custom in defense of their traditions and their control of the labor process and manufacturers. What was strange, new, and unusual was capitalism and the efforts to impose capitalist economic regulation of production by market forces. Since this was a protracted process which started in agricultural relations and advanced in some lines of manufacturing before others, as the process wore on, working people were able to get an ever clearer picture of what type of society was being brought into existence and the disadvantages and losses they would suffer if they, their resistance failed. Thus they were seeking to preserve and protect their communities, their way of life as they knew it, and their independence from being destroyed and from being replaced by something entirely new, which being new and therefore full of unforeseeable consequences appeared to pose enormous risks. Rather than take a leap in the crap dark, Craftsmen and their allies sought to preserve the mode of production that they had known and relied on since time out of mind. The Paradox of Custom how could custom, which had always been associated with tradition and conservatism, become associated with rebellion? The great paradox of the 18th century, writes E.P. Thompson, is that, quote, we have a rebellious traditional culture, end quote. This was, as already suggested, a reflection of the profound transformation in the social relations taking place in British society, Prior to the 18th century, custom was in general associated with order, obedience, and conservatism. Quote, it was the religious duty of everyone, whatever their position in the hierarchy, to render unquestioning obedience to their divinely ordained superiors and to impose it on those entrusted to their charge. Without this control, the innate wickedness of fallen man would result in general anarchy and insecurity. End quote. In this way, the church was the institution most responsible for promoting and maintaining a highly conservative social order in which the economy was embedded in and separ inseparable from the culture, 
and was normatively regulated by prescriptions and rules based on an understanding of what constituted, quote, custom, end quote. Over, quote, a broad spectrum of public affairs, there was no necessity to analyze and discuss what needed to be done. To every problem, there were answers based on what had always been done before, end quote. Society was comprised of a wide variety of self-financing, self-governing collectives, each with its own rules and upon which government depended. In order to serve as the arbiter of the endless disputes that arose between these groups, the states wielded Excuse me, the state wielded the stick of requiring deference and obedience to a preordained hierarchy and offered the carrot of patronage. In 18th century Britain, the forces of agrarian capitalism and the beginnings of an industrial capitalism were uprooting the institutional foundations of custom and introduced a radical transformation subversive of the traditional so social order. The traditional bonds of mutual dependence were between plebeian workers and peasants and patrician gentry and peerage were being eroded, and in the process the gap between the cultures of the rich and the poor was widening. In the context of the onslaught against customary rights and customary forms of property, the public ceremonies of popular culture became more visible. They were codified with greater exactitude. This was no longer just a, quote, traditional culture, end quote, writes Thompson. Quote, powerful self-motivating forces of social and moral regulation were at work, end quote. And the customary norms being defended were not, were, quote, not identical with those proclaimed by church or authority, end quote. The customary norms being defended were coming to be, quote, defined within the plebeian culture itself, end quote. A crucial point to derive from Thompson's work for the purposes of this study is that poor and working people were neither passive agents simply swept away by the newly, quote, unleashed, end quote, forces of the market, nor mindless contrarians pitting themselves against the inevitability of progress in the factory system. They were dynamically engaged with the process of change that confronted them, and so in the process of the broad transformation of social relations, the idea of custom itself changed as plebeians sought to assert their rights in both old and new forms. In investigating the gamut of rituals in 18th and early 19th century plebeian culture in Britain while dressing, rush bearings, harvest homes, skimmington riding, shiver shiveries, the stag hunt, quote, groaning, rough music, and wife sales, Thompson finds that far from having the steady permanence suggested by the word, quote, tran tradition, Custom was a field of change and of contest, an arena in which opposing interests made conflicting claims, end quote. This meant that custom in the 18th century was, quote, in continual flux, end quote, having increasingly become, quote, the rhetoric of legitimation for almost any usage, practice, or demanded right, end quote. In 18th century Britain, as the, as the elite launched an all-out assault on customary rights in the name of private property and free trade, and as customary law was extinguished, the status of customary laborers was gradually eroded whilst women, children, and paupers were pressed into factories and workhouses. In the midst of this assault on custom, the plebs employed the discourse of customary right creatively, not only in defending those long-held rights and privileges that were under assault, but also in asserting new rights in the form of new customs. While the level of skimmington ridings and the like, the paradoxical Invention of new customs may be seen as a useful tactic in the class struggle at the level of tenancy rights it was most controversial. Quote, squatters and other migrants, end quote, Wright, King, and Tompkins were, quote, agents in the fabrication of their own economy of makeshifts, inventing traditions where there were none, claiming rights by virtue only of residents manipulating custom in their own interest. Settlement at the margins of a forest economy was not, therefore, a survival strategy legitimately played out in a context of widely recognized ethical rules, but a survival tactic, which ingeniously exploited the, quote, unstoppable, unstopped cracks and the wainscoting of power, end quote, all of which brings us to the vexed question of who actually was entitled to common right.
in the early 17th century, at a time when there were perhaps 170 households in the parish, Brigstock possessed 53 suit houses, two half and nine quarter suit houses, whose tenants were allowed house bought the right to take timber for house repairs by order of the forest courts. The tenants of the ancient commonable cottages resented the poor migrants who claimed customary rights simply on the basis of residence for the poor migrant to the forest. Therefore, custom came to be regarded not as cohesive, but rather as a restrictive ideology, one of the structural constraints within and around which survival tactics were perforce developed, end quote. King and Tompkins. This adds a layer of complexity to our discussion of custom that must not be overlooked. The observance of custom was conservative as a rule, but it was subject to bending by, by those like the forest squatters here who sought to claim rights that had not hitherto been recognized in local customary law. That this should have offended the, quote, legitimate customary tenants should remind us that early modern England was a deeply stratified society. Those who had tenancy rights, however minimal, were still in a better position than those who had no tenancy rights. From this it follows that in seeking to understand the role of custom during the period of the Industrial Revolution and the reasons why it became so, quote, robust, end quote, especially in the late 18th century, we need to examine far more than the strict institutional foundations of the customary law of the manor. At the same time, we can point to the long-term process of the extinguishing, extinguishing of customary law through a closure as having already initiated the first major assault on customary rights in the interest of promoting agrarian capitalism. Manorial customary law vary, varied widely from region to region in its details, but its scope generally extended well beyond the delineation of field boundaries and the inheritance rights of copyholds and freeholds. It also governed the rights of commons, including right of pasture, quote, defining which animals how many and where could take, quote, bite of mouth, end quote, on the open fields after harvest, end quote. Right of estiver, or the right to take wood from the commoners, waste or forest for various purposes, right or turbery, or the right to cut peat or turf, furs for fuel, or to make ashes up for, fertil for fertilizer, right of piscary, or the right to fish in parish streams and ponds, as well as hunting rights or rights to collect acorns, berries, mast for pigs, sand or gravel, among other items from the commons. Footnote. Right of pasture included, quote, levancy and couchancy, end quote, defined as, quote, a stint of common in contradistinction to common sans nombre and signifies only so many of the msuge or fawn will by its produce maintain, end quote. The reader will note that with, that with the extinction of agrarian customary law and the associated normative social relations, an entire vocabulary of terms entirely fell out of usage from the English language. End footnote. All these customs were governed by the manorial court, which, quote, settled disputes made by laws about the maintenance of the fields and common pastures, protecting them from overstocking fine transgressors and supervised a small bureaucracy of pointers, fieldsmen, even mole catchers, end quote. Hay and Rogers, 1997. These customary rights were also sanctioned by the church, which was directly involved in the, their maintenance. Gleaning the right to gather leftover grain after the reaping was sanctioned by the Bible, quote, Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of the harvest, thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger, end quote. 
and the parish bells were often rung upon the opening of the fields after harvest. All these rites were threatened, if not eliminated, upon enclosure. More recent historiography has revealed that resistance to parliamentary enclosure was more extensive than previous scholarship had allowed. Actions ranged from petitions to tearing down fences to public protests. Hay and Rogers gave several examples, a crowd of football players in Northamptonshire abruptly turning on and burning 2,000 pounds worth of fences. Anti-enclosure protesters being subdued in Wilberston and forced to unload wagons of fencing under the watch of the armed of armed cavalry. Cavalry. A crowd of 60 women in Burton on Trent pulling down fences in 1771, subsequently arrested, jailed, and rescued by a crowd of 300. This last vignette testifies to the impact of enclosures on women who made the most use of the commons and who underwent significant proletarianization as a result of enclosures. With the earlier piecemeal enclosures, the loss of common rights could be gradual, but the parliamentary enclosures of the late 18th century were typically wholesale, enclosing the arable fields, wastes, and commons. The remaining tenants were typically cottagers. Some limited access to commons in the form of gleaning and other customary rights may have persisted, but these were prescribed over time and even grazing rights would become subject to market contracts. Footnote. Thompson writes that, quote, even in hard-headed terms, there are sound reasons for affordable, affording latitude in minor common rights. It is better that a labor force should remain resident and available for the heavy calls of hay and harvest and incidental calls for labor, including the extensive women's service in hall, farmhouse, and dairy, end quote. Thompson. This passage is in reference to an unenclosed parishes around 1750 but such considerations would have applied after enclosure applied after enclosure as well between 1793 and 1813 some 2000 acts of enclosure were passed by parliament twice the figure for 1760 to 1780 it is against this background as the remaining excuse me So it is against this background as the remaining quarter or third of open fields was being enclosed and the remaining, quote, commoners rendered market dependent, that the domestic upheavals of the era of the French wars took place. Britain's population was truly becoming the first people in the world to depend primarily upon markets for access to the means of subsistence. To the complexities of war and, high tide, and the high tide of enclosures, we must add a series of poor harvests. Between 1793 and 1818, only three abundant harvests were brought in, while 14 were deficient. The years 1795 to 6 and 1800 to 1801 were described in some parts as, quote, famines. Unprecedented numbers of agrarian laborers took part in food protest as they could scarcely supply their families with bread. Another low point came in 1813, the increasing pressure on food supplies and grain markets, which the displacement of self-subsistence agriculturalists now, quote, hurled, end quote, into a situation of market dependence added to the pressures of population growth could only have exacerbated hardships. It cannot be coincidence that grain imports doubled in this period while grain exports virtually ceased. In the 1950s, Professor Chambers' work, which seemed to confirm the optimism of political economy with regard to enclosure, enjoyed a brief orthodoxy. Based on evidence from Nottinghamshire, Chambers argued that the effect of enclosures was to increase overall demand for agrarian labor. But this orthodoxy was short-lived as subsequent studies suggested the contrary, and that post-enclosure parishes experienced out-migration, less regularity of employment, and increases in the poor rates. Another major factor was the loss of rights of turbary. What had been a closely regulated right of commons now became a crime, the customary right of taking fireboat or, quote, snapping wood, end quote, from the commons was probably the longest to survive and the most coveted. Wood was used for many purposes, and being in short supply, it was in high demand. The large numbers of prosecutions for, quote, stealing wood, 
quote, stealing, end quote, wood in the late 18th century mainly arose from attempts by commoners to assert their customary rights after these rights had been effectively criminalized. To all these pressures, we must add the impact which the spread of the factory had on forms of buy employment such as spinning. Cottage manufacturing had provided a kind of safety net for countless peasant households who had now become cottagers. By 1788, there were 60,000 hands employed in factory spinning and over 10,000 in hand weaving. By 1806, there would be 90,000 factory spinners and 184,000 hand weavers. The swelling in numbers of those engaged in rural domestic manufacturing during the late 18th century meant that many more were becoming domestic producers of handicrafts at the very same time as the customary regulations that I had that had long governed such trades were coming under increasing strain and attack. In effect, the rural population was caught in the cross-currents of the successive waves of agrarian and industrial capitalism. It is only logical to expect that direct producers who found themselves prescribed from exercising their customary rights of ancient origin would become upon shifting to reliance upon the sale of yarn, cloth, or other goods produced in their domestic workshops and garrets, particularly attentive to the customary rights of their trades. As we have seen, Elizabethan law had been based upon the regulations of the now defunct guilds and were directed in the urban-based guilds of the 16th century. With the expansion of rural manufactures in the 18th century, the principles of customary craft regulation that had been enshrined in Elizabethan law were now being asserted in both new and old trades at a time when employers were already seeking to circumvent what they saw as restrictions upon freedom of trade. In this context, rights that were asserted in the name of custom were quote in rea were in, excuse me. In this context, rights that were asserted in the name of custom were in reality quote claims, encroachments, negotiated positions between employers and workers, masters and servants, or members of different trades, end quote. As in the case of such customary rights as gleaning in agriculture, the remnants of production and manufacturing also became an object of deep contention. The existence of extensive opportunities for resale in manufacturing areas meant that it was easy to realize the value of appropriated materi raw materials and often hard to prosecute. Legislation seeking to curb the unauthorized absconding of raw materials by employees stretches from 1512 to 1792. It was a particular problem in putting out operations since direct supervision was lacking. Since employers or putter-outers sometimes suffered serious losses, the problem of embezzlement was surely a significant impetus toward the centralization of production. Pollard notes that putting a check on embezzlement by employees was one of the main achievements of the imposition of rigorous discipline in the factory or workshop. For the laborer, the sale of embezzled materials or products made with them could amount to an increase in income of 20% or more. Just as smuggling was widely condoned by laboring people, so too was embezzlement or claiming the, quote, takings, end quote. In part, the ambiguity arose from the fact that at certain times in certain industries, such rights were recognized as customary. Brazier's Quote, Brasiers took, quote, fillings, end quote. Textile workers took, quote, fence and thrums, end quote. Bracket, the fringes and ends left over from cloth production, end bracket. Shipwrights took, quote, chips, end quote, dot, 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 end quote. Hay and Rogers, 1997. There was an ebb and flow at work in this process. During periods in which the money supply was short, employers were happy to negotiate a partial payment of wages in kind, reinforcing the notion of the worker's right to take home some of the raw materials. In good times, the extent of such perquisites might be extended. But in hard times, they might tighten their enforcement of fines and deductions. All of this added to a general legal ambiguity regarding the status of materials which passed through the hands of relatively independent workers. <laughs>
The expansion of the domestic market in the 18th century made it possible in large-scale operations for whole subsidiary trades of considerable lucrativeness to arise out of the marketing of such post-production materials. Where workers had once been allowed to take home otherwise valueless waste materials for domestic use, such takings were now seen as a loss of value. 18th century legit legalization codified previous practices, extending the length of sentences for embezzlement and shifted the burden of proof from the accuser to the accused. By the end of the century, the number of convictions grew enormously as a government subsidy supported a private policing system designed to curb the practice in Yorkshire wool and Worstead industries. Not only production, but also trade had been regulated by customs since at least Anglo-Saxon times. The pattern follows a very similar trajectory to the role of custom in crafts. The entitlements and expectations of both craft trades and markets were codified in Tudor legislation and inscribed in local practice and ritual. It was under 5 and 6 Edward VI, C14, that the normative regulation of markets was enshrined in common law. And the primary offenses of forestalling, regrading, and engrossing were defined. These prohibitions were concerned almost exclusively with, exclusively with the marketing of food provisions. Forestalling was the act of preempting the otherwise natural operation of the market by intercepting the product before it reached the point of sale with the intent to artificially induce a higher price. This was considered an infringement on the rights of customers to the lowest possible price on household necessities, regrading and engrossing, which were each considered variations of forestalling. Regrading meant, quote, the buying of corn or other dead victual in any market and selling it again in the same market or within four miles of the place, end quote. The primary concern about regrading was that it would lead to forestalling or specifically that it would drive up the price. And so in some towns such as Oxford, the resale of goods through middlemen was effectively regulated by a system of fines, which were not disincentives so much as a roundabout way of licensing the practice, end quote. Engrossing meant, quote, the buying up of a large quantity of corn or other dead victual with a view to sell it again, by which means an individual or insufficient wealth might engross the whole of any, ne any necessary of life within a certain district and raise the price of it at his pleasure, end quote. Other offenses at the market included spreading false rumors or forming combinations, monopolies, with intent to inflate prices, employing false weights and measures, or selling adulterated food. In the early decades of the 17th century, the government codified laws against these offenses in the Book of Orders and, quote, an administrative structure to survey markets and detect market criminals, end quote, was established. Hay and Rogers, 1997. The Tudor laws had expressed the government's fear that, quote, social disasters might coincide with external threats to stability of regime, end quote. And so, particularly in times of dearth, it was essential that profiteering middlemen be checked from sweeping markets clean, inflating prices to their own advantages, and depriving the poor of their access to the, quote, necessaries of life, end quote. But such laws had no teeth without the participation of the affected population, and farmers were often paid for tipping off authorities about engrossers and regraders. But more important was the participation of the local population in public demonstration or, quote, food riots, end quote, against such corruptions of the market. The aims of the, quote, mob, end quote, were typically to seize food that was scheduled to be exported, to expose and punish for stalling, regrading, and engrossing, and most of all, to demand that food be sold locally at a, quote, just price, end quote.
Such demonstrations were known in virtually every town in 17th and 18th century Britain. They were recognized as something of an orderly ritual in which the local population asserted rights and expectations that had been codified in law. The acquiescence of the local justices of the peace in order to placate the, quote, mob was anticipated. Quote, indeed, end quote, wrote Hay and Rogers, quote, the established meaning of, quote, police, end quote, until late in the 18th century was the effective governance of towns and especially the policies that ensured food supplies and good order, end quote. Hay and Rogers, 1997. When it came to disputes, the justices of the peace had long represented themselves as referees in a society comprised of self-governing collectivities with conflicting in interests. Local justices of the peace had a strong interest in preserving his reputation. Excuse me, the local justice of the peace had a strong interest in preserving his reputation as a fair and neutral arbiter. Moreover, local officials had their own interest in established custom, inheritances, various and sundry petty fees which they collected, membership in the local vestry were all seen as property rights rooted in ancient custom. In fact, it was a long-established custom for the crown to grant exclusive rights to hold markets. Here, then, is an entirely separate source of opposition to forestallers, regraders, and engrossers, quite distinct from the government's need to keep the price of grain low in the public interest, the interests of licensed monopolists to exclude would-be interlopers, as well as the government's interest in collecting licensing fees. As the practice of licensing monopolies over holding local markets fell out of use, so this source of opposition to the practices of middlemen lost its force. By the middle of the 18th century, the strict enforcement of these laws had long fallen into desuetude, D-U-E-S-U-E-T-U-D-E, -E -E, although local magistrates continued to pursue them. But they did enjoy something of a partial revival. The Book of Orders was privately reprinted and its usage urged upon government officials in 1758. Under 31 George II, the ban on forestalling was reaffirmed where cattle being bought, excuse me, being brought to London was concerned. Such legislation, by promoting the idea that engrossers and regraders rather than poor harvests are responsible for local shortages of grain, may have actually encouraged attacks upon these middlemen. At the urging of Edmund Burke, the Edwardian ban on forestalling was reduced to a misdemeanor in 1772 under 12 George III C. 71 on the grounds that the prohibitions had, quote, in themselves a tendency to prevent free trade and enhance the price of provisions, especially to the laboring and manufacturing poor, end quote. Chitty, 1824. This was the language of political economy. It is notable that the justification for repeal could be grounded in the same corners as those that gave rise to prohibitions in the first place. The courts, however, responded to public outcries against these practices, continued to hand out convictions over the next several decades. Footnote. In Rex v. Rusby, 1799, the defendant Rusby had been indicted for regrading 30 quarters of oats, probably appealed to the 1772 repeal. Lord Kenyon nevertheless found him guilty, penning in his finding, quote, though in an evil hour all the statutes which had been existing about a century, excuse me, above a century, were at one blow repealed, yet thank God the provisions of the common law were, were not destroyed, excuse me, end quote. 
The vigor of Kenyon's address so inflamed the public that a mob tried to lynch Rusby and ended by pulling down his house. The public was apparently not so convinced by Burke, Smith, and Parliament that forced stalling was economically beneficial, or at least that laws prohibiting it were more harmful than the thing itself. End quote. Letwin, 1954. The last conviction was in 1800, when two men were sentenced to three months in prison for forestalling cattle. In 1812, a case against engrossers of whale oil was dismissed. In 1844, the final repeal of all statutes against these offenses was repealed in 8 Victoria C-24. This act repealed all legislation banning forestalling, regrading, and engrossing, stretching back to the first ban on forestalling registered in the statute books in 1266. End footnote. For most of its centuries-long history, agrarian capitalism had rendered only a part of the population dependent upon the market for access to food and other means of subsistence. While more than half of the cultivable land in England had been enclosed by 1750, rights of common were still widespread. The extinguishing of customary rights to the remaining old fields, waste, and commons by parliamentary enclosure during the later, latter half of the 18th century brought the greatest hardship to the cottager and the small holder. The Tudor laws, particularly the Settlement Act of 1662, were written at a time when vagrants and vagabonds were seen as a threat to social order. The solution was for all hands to be put to work, and this could be accomplished if all recognized their natural superiors in a hierarchical order. The displacement of large sections of the agrarian population from access to the means of subsistence had created the necessity of offsetting their new vulnerability as market-dependent producers to the price of food in the form of the poor laws and the close regulation of markets by the state in the interests of protecting the poor from starvation. But what happens when, in the context of an unprecedented growth in population, virtually the entire population is in the, general, is in the process of becoming dependent upon markets for food? Now you have a new situation. A large and growing displaced population meant rising poor rates. If local protest over food had once served as a kind of local barometer, indicating the need for state intervention in order to restore the local equilibrium between the interest of sellers and the necessity of local food supply, the transformation of social relations brought on by agrarian capitalism was now prompting a new and entirely different response from authorities. Increasingly, the legitimacy that the, quote, food riot, end quote, had once enjoyed was waning. Authorities were coming around to the view that it was neither a reasonable way for the local population to invoke state intervention to protect local food markets, nor even a legitimate way of releasing pent-up social anxiety. Instead, by... Being lumped in with all forms of, quote, riot, the, quote, food riot, end quote, began to be seen as a threat to social stability. In the crisis years of 1795 and 1801, farm laborers were among the main participants in such disturbances. Among, amongst farm laborers, as well as domestic workers, factory workers, colliers, and the poor, the growing prosperity of tenant farmers was increasingly evident, and resentment was not in short supply. Local justices of the peace were caught between the need to uphold the image of impartiality versus the pressure to enforce the new and harsh laws which criminalized protest and other threats to private property. In legal disputes between laborers and their employers, justices of the peace tended to side with laborers for the simple reason that a lowering of wages resulted in a greater burden on the poor rates. In order for such tendencies to be broken, what was needed was a doctrine which would convince them of the rectitude of the law and to which they could refer in leaning towards the law and against custom.
a Whig state of mind, end quote. Political economy, the bloody code, and the decline of paternalism. There is nothing more political than the making of lulls. It is profoundly curious how political economy as a body of scholarship gave rise to modern neoclassical economics, which eschews politics and dwells almost strictly on the imagining of the, quote, purely, end quote, economic. Political economy was, after all, political. Its principal aim was to direct state policymakers in shaping and managing the economy and it was under Pitt's administration in the 1790s that its doctrines first came to be implemented in any systematic fashion. The Hammonds describe the influence of political economy upon the thinking of Britain's elite as, quote, economic fatalism, end quote. This required, first of all, the recasting of trade in a new light. Rather than being a zero-sum contest between nations, a concept Adam Smith associated with mercantilist thought, it was instead government interference with trade, which by interfering with Smith's obvious and simple system of natural liberty, end quote, restricted the actions of merchants and capitalists and held back the growth of economic prosperity. Additionally, rather than being opposed to the interest of workmen where work child, the self-interest of the employer was actually in accord with it because, as Burke wrote, the greater the profit motive, the greater the desire of the employer would be in attending to, quote, the good condition of those, bracket, upon, end bracket, whose labor his gains must principally depend, end quote. We must be careful not to invite confusion. Burke's employer was a farmer, not a manufacturer. The latter, the latter notion no doubt resonated with manufacturers, but Adam Smith's principal appeal was to the gentry and yeoman farmers of the countryside. What is important to recognize about the meteoric rise of popularity of Smith's work is that it depended not upon any grounding in history or fact, but in providing a systematic theoretical rationale that informed capitalist landlords, tenant farmers, and manufacturers of the self-evident moral justice that lay behind the principles of liberal thought and the emerging capitalist system. It was later compared to a system of metaphysics. Footnote. By the author and clergyman Sidney Smith, according to Hammond and Hammond. End footnote. One of Smith's purposes in writing The Wealth of Nations was to provide a, quote, model of the workings of the economy, end quote. Not any specific economy, but the economy in general. By universalizing the principles of the capitalist economy, Smith's work laid the foundation for the subsequent tendency to imagine that the capitalist system had long or always been in existence, waiting in the interstices of feudalism, and, it, and that its further growth and unfolding required only the removal of the hindrances of, quote, fetters, end quote, upon its growth and development. Secondly, Smith's work was intended as a, quote, policy recommendation of free trade and laissez-faire generally, end quote. Quote, what political economy forbade, end quote, writes Thompson, quote, was any, quote, violent interference with the course of trade, end quote, including the prosecution of profiteers or hoarders. Sorry. the fixing of maximum prices, the government intervention in grain or rice dealing, end quote. Markets, or rather the market, like the economy, were elevated to an abstract principle as is strikingly evident in the following passage from Burke, who writes, quote, market is the meeting and conference of the consumer and producer when they mutually discover each other's wants. The moment that government appears at market all the principles of market will be subverted. End quote, end quote. As cited in Thompson. The quote, principles of the market, end quote, are here conceptualized as universal truths existing independently of history or any given set of social relations. Markets had thus always already existed and needed only the removal of the fetters of government regulation and custom in order to follow, quote, th their 
to follow their, quote, natural, end quote, course. This method of thinking was deeply informed by the methods of the natural sciences, such as physics, where it was necessary to conceptualize the interaction of moving or colliding bodies in the abstract, free from all other interferences. So here we see Burke, under the influence of Smith, writing of, quote, market, end quote, in the same way one might write about, quote, gravity, end quote. The affinity of political economy with the natural sciences appeared to give it greater weight as a, quote, scientific discourse, and definitely added to its appeal. The wealth of nations impresses Thompson, however, quote, less as an essay in empirical inquiry than as a superb self-validating essay in logic, end quote. Footnote. Thomas points, excuse me, Thompson points out that while the term, quote, market, end quote, can refer to a market or to the market as metaphor, quote, too often discourse about, quote, the market, end quote, conveys the sense of something definite, a space or institution of exchange, perhaps London's corn exchange at Mark Lane, when in fact, something t sometimes unknown to the term's user, it is being employed as a metaphor of econo economic process, or an idealization or abstraction from that process, end quote. Thompson. At least Burke was careful enough to drop the definite article. End footnote. At the time that Smith was writing, the wealth of nations, the cause of laissez-faire was moving forward and appeals to custom were losing their sway, such as when legislation banning the practice of forced stalling was repealed in 1772. For 18th century liberals, the greater abuses arose from the, quote, network of customary and legal restrictions, which impeded the entrepreneur or rel of relatively modest size who sought to exercise his abilities, quote, the grand enemy of the age, end quote, end quote, wrote it, noted Tawny, quote, was monopoly, end quote, end quote. Fox, 1985, quoting Tawny. The ideal society in, in the mind of British Enlightenment theorists, quote, Quote, was a society where each man had free access to the economic opportunities which he could use and enjoy the wealth which by his efforts he had created, end quote, end quote. Smith's work fits into this liberal tradition, but with some important departures. Footnote. McNally provides a far more in-depth and nuanced discussion of Smith's thought that can be offered then can be offered here, discussing the various influences on Smith's thought, including the Commonwealth tradition, the tradition of natural jurisprudence, the Whigs and physiocrats. End footnote. Smith was also very much a product of his time. It can, if we can look beyond its ahistoricism and tendency to universalize capitalist economics, in some ways Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations reads like a snapshot of the state of agrarian capitalism at the barest advent of industrial capitalism, and just prior to the advent of the factory system, Smith had spent time in France, was a personal friend of Kinney, Q-U-E-S-N-A-Y, and was influenced by the thinking of the physiocrats. While he did not agree with their view that the source of all wealth was agriculture, their influence was evident in his view that agriculture was the best investment, as he writes, quote, The capital that is acquired to any country by commerce and manufactures is all a very precarious and uncertain possession, till some part of it has been secured and realized in the cultivation and improvement of its lands, end quote. Only two of the book's 900 pages reference machinery, and then only to argue that the application of machinery, which for Smith arises out of the division of labor, is very advantageous because the application of machinery tends to lower the cost of goods and is likely to increase rather than decrease employment. The farmer and the landlord were, according to Smith, quote, the least subject to the wretched spirit of monopoly, and are generally disposed rather to promote than obstruct the cultivation and improvement of their neighbors' farms and estates, end quote. Footnote. 
One should observe that as agrarian capitalism was advanced by this time, while capitalism and industry was just starting to achieve real control over production, it makes perfect sense that Smith would find farmers and landlords to be less beholden to the spirit of monopoly. Fifty or a hundred years later, these relative outlooks would appear very different. End footnote. Unlike manufacturers, gentlemen and farmers openly share their discoveries and innovation of production, and being dispersed throughout the countryside, they cannot easily form combinations. Consistent with his hostility to monopolies, Smith was critical of employer combinations and attempts by merchants and manufacturers to reduce competition in the interest of depressing wages and increasing their profits. This, for Smith, would deprive working people of their rightful benefits in a growing and prosperous economy. While Joan Thirsk found Smith's harsh criticism of rural domestic manufacturers too simplistic, even a, quote, grotesque caricature of the weaver farmer, end quote, Maxine Berg clarifies that Smith's denunciations were not directed at the independent craft laborer, but at the merchant employer operating on the putting out system. Quote, the countryside and its workforce had been put at a disadvantage by a long history of economic policies designed to promote the interest of urban incorporated industries at the expense of agriculture and other rural enterprises. Smith was indeed critical of these developments, but in his model of the natural progress of opulence, what better sustained analysis and prescription for the agricultural origins of industry? What greater praise for the significance of basic domestic commodities catering to a home market, and for the importance of the rural industries which gave rise to the fast-growing urban areas of the period. Smith was a theorist whose economic analysis was a social and moral tribute to the growth of agriculture and the development of the country region, and its own integrated towns as opposed to the wealthy mercantile city. And he was a theorist who want, found in tenant farmers, country laborers, and independent artisans a class whose individual interests and attributes were preeminently conducive to the growth of the wealth of the nations, end quote. Excuse me, of the nation, end quote. Berg, 1983. Far from condemning the unregulated labors of rural artisans, Smith was their champion, in all of this, Smith stands as the classical spokesman for agrarian capitalism and as an expression, to a certain extent, of the older school of British conservatism in, in which it was seen as the obligation of the ruling landed elite to look after the interests of the poor. This points to the deep tension within Smith's work and within agrarian capitalism itself. On the one hand, Smith declares his hostility to the, quote, traditional, end quote, policies of mercantilism and of customary order, chartered monopolies, employers' combinations, fixed wage rates, restrictions on labor mobility, and independent servitude all had to go, excuse me, indentured servitude all had to go. On the other hand, Smith tacitly approved of the poor laws and in what was a traditional view looked to the, quote, natural aristocracy, end quote, the landed gentleman, to, quote, exercise those civic virtues without which corruption and decay were inevitable, end quote, while idealizing markets as offering all classes the means to increase their own share of the national wealth, the landed classes with their supposed virtues were to provide the moral check on the forces of coercion and exploitation that could be unleashed by the deregulation of markets. This tension went deeper than a conflict between agrarian capitalism and emerging industrial capitalism or between custom and free markets. The growth of capitalism has always presented choices in the form of trade-offs. For the landed classes, the expansion of capitalist tenant farming on enclosed farms came with the decline of the employment of servants in husbandry and customary bonds of deference and independence. For merchants and manufacturers, the expansion and deregulation of markets came with heightened competition and the decline of chartered monopolies. <clears throat> 
and for the growing number of wage laborers who often asserted traditional rights based in custom, the liberal creed of free markets, freedom of contract, and self-realization had a definite allure. This is a crucial point. For while the radical movements of the late 18th and early 20th centuries sought to retain rights and privileges rooted in custom, there would be no nostalgia for the decline of indentured servitude or tradi the traditional hierarchy in which each was born in a, in a station of life, with little room for upward mobility. X Fox writes, quote, However much wage earners might look back to a supposedly golden age of guild or state protection, when they contemplated their workplace predicament, there were many respects in which they looked forward to a condition of individual rights and liberation, end quote. Inasmuch as Smith was true to his principles and consistently defended the interest of working populations within the new market order, he invited adherents amongst the working class. It is thus no surprise that self-described, quote, Smithian socialists, end quote, emerged among the radicals of by the 1820s. Yet inasmuch as this concern was rooted in conservatism that had its origins in the paternalist paternalistic ties of master and servant of the old economy. It was virtually inevitable that later apologists for capitalism would strip Smith's teaching of this moral component and retain to the market rhetoric, which, quote, joined to a moral crusade against the, quote, indolence, end quote, of the poor, end quote, would, quote, serve as a powerful ideological weapon against the working class in the age of the Industrial Revolution, end quote. To this we must add the growing body of criminal law directed at poor and working people. Confronted with this combined arsenal, the pressure on the non-propertied classes to seek out new forms of emancipation was only intensified. With the expansion of the domestic market and the conversion to a money economy and money wages over the course of the 18th century, the corresponding rapid expansion of wealth brought with it a heightened desire for security of property. Court responding to this concern, Parliament passed one act after another, making crimes against property punishable by the death penalty. The cornerstone of this, quote, bloody code, end quote, was the Black Act of 1723, which set down a wide variety of new capital punishments for actions as trivial as stealing a fawn, giving the landed oligarchs a, quote, versatile armory of death, end quote, with which to confront any challenges to the security of their landed property. Thompson. The new wealth of the patrician elite offered tempting rewards to the burglar, the footpad, and the highwayman. In London's metropolis, where it was not possible to exercise the same level of paternalistic control as in the countryside, was unique in seeing the development of a criminal underground. To the pickpocket and the thief, the city offered the advantage of anonymity, narrow alleys and slum districts where police did not tread. Unlike rural thieves who often stole food or, or were prosecuted under new laws against what had once been rights on the commons, <laughs> London's thieves stole money and household goods such as the silver, uh, silver excuse me, such as plate silver. While the 18th century saw a number of master thieves such as Jonathan Wilde, Dick Turpin, and or Jack Shepard. Most crimes involved petty thievery and were motivated primarily by urban poverty. There was a perception that wickedness in general was on the rise, but we must consider that crime may not have grown in equal proportion to the expansion of wealth, and we must also bear in mind that the expansion of capital offenses was out of all proportion to the growth of crime. This expansion of capital offenses be, can be partly explained by a kind of snowball effect. Quote, if you hanged for sheep stealing, logically you had also to hang the man who stole a cow or a goat. There would literally be no end to the crazy cycle of, quote, deterrence, end quote, end quote. McLinn, 1989. The crime of murder nearly always 
arises from entirely deep-seated personal motives like passion or family disputes, and the severity of the punishment has never seemed to have much deterring effect. The homicide rate in Britain was well below that of Europe, but the expansion in the number of capital offenses was out of proportion with the crime rate. Moreover, the new offenses being added were nearly all in defense of property rather than of person. Burglary was the most common crime committed, and most typically that what drove men and women to steal was poverty. But the absurdity of the vast expansion of capital offenses is that it had virtually no deterring effect, since the new laws did nothing to address the poverty and distress underlying crimes against property. As customary and communal rights in the countryside and the chartered rights and privileged monopolies in crafts and trade were being dismantled, they were replaced with what were effectively new forms of absolute individual property rights. Quote, for Adam Smith, end quote, writes Thompson, quote, property was either, quote, perfect, end quote, and absolute, or it was meaningless, end quote. Thompson. The, quote, elevation of property above all, other values, end quote, writes Thompson, was a, quote, Whig state of mind, end quote. Quote, again and again, end quote, writes Hay, quote, the voice of money and power declare the sacredness of property in terms hitherto reserved for human life. Banks were credited with souls and the circulation of gold likened to that of blood, end quote. Hay, 1975. At the same time, the belief in a world imbued with magical powers was in decline. Footnote, except perhaps when it came to the ritual of public execution. While the king no longer condescended to offer the, quote, touch, end quote, to victims of scrofula, quote, the, quote, death sweat, end quote, of executed malefactors was still held to possess the power to cure this disease, end quote. Lineball, 1975. The burning of witches in a world imbued with magical powers was in decline. Oh, sorry, I've been too far back. End footnote. The burning of witches and the tormenting of heretics were punishments belonging to the past, but summary justice was not. Secure in their estates there where they were surrounded by servants and guards, the landed gentry and peerage had little reason to care about petty thievery or the occasional murder in London. As members of Parliament, they gave the true guardians of their class, the local justices of the peace, sweeping powers, quote, to convict offenders without the trouble of legalistic indictments or tender-minded juries. In cases involving grain, wood, trees, garden produce, fruit, turnips, dogs, cattle, horses, the hedges of parks, and game, summary proceedings usually yielded a speedy and simple conviction." End quote. Hey. The focus of such legislation, including the Black Act, testifies to an obsession with agrarian property. Between 1688 and 1765, the number of capital offenses rose from less than 50 to around 160, and by 1815, the total was around 225. This included only those offenses explicitly carrying the death penalty. Not the number of offenses potentially carrying the death penalty put the figure far higher, yet the use of execution did not grow to match. Occasional public hangings in the face-to-face -face community of the town served to set an example. Quote, the landed rulers of England did not need to hang all those indicted for felony. The assumption was of exemplary, the assumption was of exemplary rather than retributive punishment. End quote. In unpacking the issue, Hay responds to contemporary critics who complain that the low number of prosecutions showed that the law was not an effective deterrent of crime by countering with the suggestion that ideology was an important as, as important as coercion in the efforts of the ruling class to utilize the law as an instrument of securing their rule and their hegemony. To this end, they deployed, quote, levers of fear and, and mercy, end quote, to invoke terror, 
Yes, but also to sustain belief in the legitimacy of the law by frequently granting pardons or preserving the prerogative to deliver sentences well short of the harsh penalties prescribed by the law. The show of paternalistic benevolence in the courtroom was intended, quote, to move the court to impress the onlookers by word and gesture to fuse terror and argument into the amalgam of um, legitimate power in their minds, end quote. Hey, such theater was not only necessary, in a, but indeed proved effective in maintaining a certain level of confidence in a legal system that was increasingly invoked to fill the breach created by the decline in traditional beliefs that could no longer be sustained through religion. As the law increasingly focused on rights of property, this began to make itself felt outside of ruling circles. From 18th century Excuse me, 18th century Britain was a society rife with patronage and bribery. Positions from the, quote, city recorder to the merest turnkey in the fleet prison had to be bought. Citizens who petitioned for justice had themselves to line the pockets of those who had bought these, quote, places, end quote, end quote. McClin, 1989. Educated men, fallen from favor, took to the highways and claimed a desolate stretch of road as, in effect, their property, politely, for the most part, extorting valuables from their unwary victims. This was consistent with the mid-18th century concept of, quote, property, end quote, as encompassing both customary rights and perquisites, whether truly of ancient standing or recently invented. In this sense, the defense of custom by commoners was not strictly backward-looking, for increasingly those who claimed rights and custom adapted the language of their claims to that of the emerging market culture. Smith's achievement in Wealth of Nations was to collect the work of previous thinkers and package them in a systematic theoretical framework. Footnote. Oh, never mind, no footnote. Thompson describes the potency of this new economic theory as, quote, no less far-reaching than the more widely debated dissolutions of restrictions upon usury. End quote. Thompson, 1989. In elite discourse, custom came to be defined as, quote, usurpation, archaic ignorance, immorality, even criminality, end quote. Hay and Rogers, 1997. Smith dismissed customary arguments against forestalling and engrossing, quote, as superstitious on a level with witchcraft, end quote. Footnote. Thompson, 1989, is a member of the jury of 17, of a 1779 case in which a man was convicted for regrading oats. Lord Kenyon wrote, quote, I wish Dr. Adam Smith had lived to hear the evidence of today, and then he would have seen whether such an offense exists and whether it is to be dreaded. If he had been told that the cattle and corn were brought to market and then brought and then bought by a man whose purse happened to be larger than his neighbor's, so that the poor man who walks the street and earns his daily bread by his daily labor could get none but through his hands and at the price he chose to demand, that it had been raised to three pence, six pence, one shilling, two shillings, and more a quarter on the same day, would he have said that there was no danger from such an offense, end quote, end quote. For his part, Smith opposed any policy that would raise prices above their, quote, natural, end quote, level, as a, as tending to, quote, diminish the public opulence, end quote. At the same time, he criticized merchants and manufacturers for complaining of the expensiveness of labor, but saying, staying silent when their own profits rose to a level harmful to society. Thus, Lord Kenyon's attack may seem misplaced when put against these sentiments of Smith, but at the same time, Smith's, quote, natural price, end quote, was precisely that which was governed by the law of supply and demand. 
As McNally comments, quote, Smith's theory of value was riddled with inconsistencies, end quote. End footnote. But it is precisely in relation to the economy of food where the theory was and remains the most controversial. Political economy promoted the notion that high prices were a necessary if painful remedy for food scarcity because the law of supply and demand dictates that supplies will be attracted to a region where prices are high. The high this logic leads, however, to what Thompson calls a, quote, most unhappy error, end quote. It ignores the problem that arises when a portion of the population lacks the purchasing power to obtain grain at high prices, or in some cases, even when prices are low. Quote, Rationing by price, end quote, writes Thompson, quote, does not allocate resources equally among those in need. It reserves the supply to those who can pay the price and excludes those who can't, end quote. Footnote. Thompson. Thompson borrows from the work of Amartya Sen on late 20th century food shortages. Sen's work is based on entitlements to food which could range from self-subsistence agriculture to food supplied by the master in living in arrangements to food purchased on the market. Once food entitlements are lost, poor people can find themselves outside the market and self-reinforcing and a self-reinforcing cycle can lead to famine. Rather than preaching inaction along the lines of Smith, Sen says that the only way to break the cycle is to rapidly import large amounts of green into the affected regions. End footnote. For a society nearing the completion of a transition from self-subsistent peasant agriculture to one in which all economic actors come to be dependent upon the market for their subsistence, Imposing a new dogma that preached government inaction was dangerous in the extreme, and in many regions Britain came nearer to famine in 1795 and 1801 than it had since the upheavals of the 17th century, despite the enormous expansion of wealth that had, had since occurred. The famines which later took place in India and Ireland were also to a considerable degree attributable to the implementation of policies by the British state designed to promote free trade at the expense of economic relations that had previously buffered direct producers from the effects of exposure to the market. In 1750, as much as half the population of Britain still practiced self-subsistent farming on open fields, by 1815 this number had shrunk to a small minority after the passage of over 3,000 acts of enclosure. In the 1750s, wage fixing and apprenticeship regulations were still in force within the woolen trade. By 1815, these had been abolished. In 1749, the broadest expansion of anti-combination legislation prior to the Combination Acts of 1799 and 1780 was passed, and the provisions of the Weaver's Combination Act were extended to many other textile crafts. Footnote. The trades covered under this Act 22 GO2 C27 section 12 included quote dyers and hot pressers felt makers and hatters and all persons employed in the manufacture of silk mohair fur hemp flax linen cotton fustian iron and leather as well as all persons employed quote in or about any of the woolen manufacturers end quote end quote the ban against combinations among hatters was specifically extended to an act of 1777, which offered the, quote, modest concession, end quote, of requiring masters to hire one journeyman for every apprentice they employed. In 1751, a committee of Parliament had recommended revocation of all apprenticeship laws. <laughs> Sorry, did I say end footnote? I can never remember if I say it. 
1751, a committee of parliament had recommended revocation of all apprenticeship laws. When Lancashire cotton weavers were faced with an influx of cheap labor in the year of 1756, they sought to extend the apprenticeship rules of five Elizabeth to their trade, but were refused. In 1773, Parliament passed the Exceptional Spitalfields Act, which limited the number of apprentices at two per weaver and sought to stabilize the wages of the Spitalfield silk workers by empowering justices of the peace to set wages and fine employers for paying any other rate. It was also a combination act, banning combinations but not petitions for higher wages. Footnote. The Act, 13 GO 3, C 6 8, Section 1, I suppose GO is for George, was specific to the London area. It was extended in 1792 to include the production of cloth made of silk mixed with other fibers. This act was exceptional in the way it amounted to government interference in the free action of market wages. It was effectively coerced out of Parliament through violent demonstrations on the part of the Spitalfields weavers protesting against the introduction of the Dutch, quote, engine, and quote, loom in their trade, into their trade, which led to armed clashes in the years 1768 to 9. Footnote, part of the dispute involved attempts by male silk weavers to exclude women from the higher paying work. Excuse me, from higher paying work. End footnote. Its real intent, according to the magistrate John Fielding, was to divert the matter back to the courts. But the legislation held for another half century, during which Spitalfields enjoyed stable and tranquil labor relations. In most other trades, appeals to custom were losing their sway in the courts, such that by the 1790s, probably the majority of judges in England had conformed to the outlook of the political economists. An example from a Lancashire Weaver Society exemplifies how such organizations responded to the increasing hostility of the courts to the customary rights of the craft trades. Their standing orders were rewritten to set out a code of strict reverence and observance of etiquette. With this in place, they felt better able to meet any, quote, grand objection that may possibly be made to the whole, and that, it, and that is it. Excuse me. With this in place, they felt better able to meet any, quote, grand objection that may possibly be made to the whole, and that is, that it will be acting too much against common law, end quote, to which they might answer, quote, quote, that we have hitherto been acting more so than we shall when once unity, order, and decency is established among us, end quote, end quote, they were ahead of their time. This card, uh, blah, blah, blah. The so-called Gordon riots marked an important turning point in the decline of custom. The worst elite fears of a, quote, mob, end quote, running amok were played out. The response was brutal. Thompson viewed this as the point of climax. Quote, For a hundred years, bracket, the poor, end bracket, were not altogether the losers. They maintained their traditional culture. They secured a partial arrest of the work discipline of early industrialism. They perhaps enlarged the scope of the poor laws. They enforced charities, which may have prevented years of dearth from escalating into a crisis of subsistence and they enjoyed liberties of pushing about the streets, jostling, gaping, and huzzang, H-U-Z-Z-A-I-N-G, pulling down the houses of obnoxious bakers or dissenters, bracket, but the Gordon riots were, end bracket, the apotheosis of plebeian license, 
and inflicted a trauma upon the rulers which was registered in a growing disciplinary tone in the 80s, end quote. Thompson, 1989. The violence of the response no doubt elicited e even greater trauma among common people. There was widespread shock that so many of those sent to the gallows were teenagers. McLean considers the Gordon riots, quote, the greatest civil disorders in England since the 1685 Manmouth Rebellion, end quote. End quote, the nearest thing to the French Revolution in English history, end quote. The outrage conjured up new and venomous responses on the part of the elite, setting the stage for the repression of the 1790s. By 1785, long-standing resistance to the development, excuse me, the deployment of professional police force yielded to the passage of the London and Westminster Police Bill. The bill was a triumph for the famous novelist Henry Fielding, the J. Edgar Hoover of his day, who served as chief magistrate in London until 1754. Fielding proposed establishing a light horse regiment in London to be at the ready upon reports of highway robberies. In 1749, he set up the Bow Street Runners, who were at first little more than, quote, glorified bounty hunters, end quote, who would go on to become a formidable precursor to Scotland Yard and the British police force. End footnote. If it were possible to delineate a point at which the patriarchal system of old ended, living only that Thompson called a, quote, patriarchal tinge, end quote, or its weaker alternative, quote, paternalism, end quote. In 1780 might be it. 1780 might be it. But the dissolution of the patriarchal bonds of the pre-capitalist estate or guild had been a long process which may have made this sort of convulsion inevitable. This is because as bonds of reciprocity were being replaced by wage contracts, a parading crowd, as parading crowds attempting to drum up support with fiddles, cornets, and drums could no longer count on the compassionate benevolence of the local justices of the peace, the local justice of the peace to intervene in the name of the law and bring regulated order to the local market, being met instead with force, the once, quote, active and reciprocal relationship, end quote, or, quote, societal field of force, end quote, end quote, that had long existed between the plebeian crowds and the patrician elite, could clearly be seen to have broken down. In 1780, this breakdown, which had already been experienced in many local villages, was now experienced on a mass scale in the metropolis. While the focus of the disturbance was Catholic relief, and while the real political grievance likely had much more to do with the American War, underneath all that was the growth, all that was the growth of a kind of semi-proletariat in the city. The government's response to the use of force signaled the end of the old reciprocities, and while it remained unclear how rulers and subjects would interact in the future, the factory posed a dismal sign of what the future pretended for workers in manufacturing. Whilst commoners in the countryside were everywhere seeing their access to means of subsistence eroded, it may be impossible to gauge the level of anxiety about the new economic realities and what role they played in 1780. But looking back forward from Peter Peterloo, 1780 could be seen to mark not so much the end of the old moral economy as much as it did the beginning of four decades of sharpening class conflict in which the role of custom in the economy was a central matter of contention. <laughs>
quote, is there any principle in these things, end quote, the return of radicalism. Followers of Enlightenment thought had high hopes when George III entrusted the government to the younger Pitt in 1783. Pitt recognized the need for reforms, was a humanitarian, a close friend to William Wilberforce, the abolitionist, and had met Adam Smith and had read his work. The most pressing problem he faced upon assuming office was dealing with a national debt that had doubled since the outset of the American War, now standing at 243 million pounds. While Pitt provided Excuse me. Well, Pitt proved to be one of the most dedicated and capable statesmen in Britain's history. He inherited a system of administration and tax collection that was both cumbersome and ancient. Government accounts still employed wooden tally sticks, and the system was, quote, cluttered with ancient survivals of practices and of offices, the original purpose of which was almost forgotten, end quote. While Pitt's initial handling of reform leaves the impression of, quote, rather desperate and unsuccessful innovation, end quote, he benefited from the recommendations of a commission that had been struck by Lord North in 1780 to examine public concerns. Although he was no doctrinaire follower of laissez-faire, Pitt was partly influenced by Smith in his pursuit of freer trade, including the reduction of duties on tea, wine, and spirits, and negotiating a commercial treaty with France, under which tariffs were lowered on both sides. The specific object of the French treaty was to take the profit out of smuggling, and in this it was successful. The loss of revenue from customs and excise was made up for in the form of lotteries and a plethora of new taxes that targeted mainly luxury items such as servants, horses, hackney coaches, windows, bricks, ribbons, candles, shops, hats, and even hair powder. In general, Pitt's policies were successful. Smuggling was reduced, and by 1785, the debt had been cut by over 10 million pounds. The new taxes, however, amounted to a general shift of taxation onto the consumer and away from the land tax. Dryden summoned up popular sentiments about the new taxes in his Alexander's Feast. Quote, Monarchs first of, first of taxes think... Taxes are a monarch's treasure, sweet the pleasure, rich the treasure, monarchs love a guinea, clink, end quote. Footnote. A tax on, quote, linen and cotton in 1784, end quote, writes Briggs, quote, was a serious economic mistake, and although Pitt had the sense to withdraw it later, the fact that he levied it at all showed that his understanding of the needs of the new industrial sector of the economy was strictly limited, end quote. End footnote. The sharp reactions to the new fundraising policies meant that many of them were quickly withdrawn, including the proposed increased excise on textiles, a tax on coals, a tax on shops, and an act to license bleachers, printers, and dyers at two pounds per annum. Later in 1797, in what was, quote, perhaps the most unpopular, end quote, and, quote, certainly the most unsuccessful of all Pitt's assessed taxes, end quote, the tax on clocks and watches proved impossible to collect, provoked a buyer's strike, and plunged the domestic watch trade into a depression. Footnote. The, quote, average working man, writes Thompson, became more methodical and, quote, subject to the productive tempo of the, quote, clock, end quote, in the years between 1780 and 1830. Pitt and his friends at the Exchequer based the tax on the assumption that a watch was a, quote, luxury item, end quote. But this, quote, small instrument which regulated the new rhythms of industrial life was at the same time one of the most urgent of the new needs which industrial capitalism called forth to energize its advance, end quote. A labor coming into a small windfall might blow it on a, more, on a watch and thus gain an item that was both useful and a symbol of prestige. Quote, moreover, the timepiece was the poor man's bank, end quote, that could be hawked in a time of need, requiring as it did a system of espionage for its enforcement, the tax proved utterly unenforceable. End footnote.
Further financial reforms included the establishment of a commission for the audit in 1785, the gradual elimination of sinecures for customs officials by allowing them to lapse upon falling vacant, imposing greater fiscal discipline on the Navy, and checking common abuses of such privileges as franking mail. In 1786, Pitt sought to put an end to the perennial to the perennial raids on his sinking fund by setting up a board of commissioners charged with the task of reform. Many of these acts were probably more geared toward restoring confidence in the system than actually reducing the debt. However, Pitt's quite quiet but steady reform of the administration did help to restore confidence. He phased out sinecures and replaced fees with salaries going much further in reducing, quote, influence, end quote, than the Rockinghams had done during their tenure. Pitt's personal commitment to political reform was demonstrated when, in knowing defiance of the king's opposition, he introduced a bill in April 1785 to disenfranchise 36 rotten boroughs, which would have provided the patrons compensation for their loss. The bill went down by a vote of 284 to 174. The House was not to seriously consider the matter of reform for another half century. As part of Pitt's reform package, he also introduced a bill in 1796 to address the distress arising from recent poor harvest by reforming the poor laws and creating, quote, schools of industry, end quote, for the employment of children in workhouses where they would produce leather and textiles. This bill also failed. Footnote. The bill was extensive and reflected both a paternalistic outlook and the influence of Smith. It included, quote, a gamut of proposals for the alleviation of the condition of the poor, family allowances, a rate in aid of wages, money to purchase a cow, schools of industry for poor children, reclamation of wasteland, a relaxation of the law of settlement, and measures to assist the provision of insurance against sickness and old age, end quote. Stedman Jones, 2004. By demonstrating his commitment to administrative, financial, economic, and electoral reform, Pitt took some of the bite out of the opposition's long-standing charge that George III's administration was rife with corruption, the boot legend, which had been revived with Fox's return to opposition. The Whig Club, made up of followers of Fox and former followers of Rockingham, promoted the idea that Pitt had come to power unconstitutionally. When Pitt's ministry challenged Fox's re-election in 1784 only to withdraw the challenge, this proved a source of embarrassment. Another embarrassment arose out of Pitt's failure to satisfactorily resolve the emergence of a tariff war between Ireland and Great Britain. The radical movement led by the volunteers was still very strong in Ireland as the excitement of the revolution in America had not fully cooled. Two reform bills introduced by Sir Edward Newenham in 1782 and Irish MP Henry Flood in 1784 were roundly defeated, but they put demands on the table for the reform of the Irish Parliament. Extension of the franchise and Catholic emancipation, demonstrations in Dublin pressured the Irish Parliament to approach Britain and ask for concessions. Pitt proposed free trade in foreign and colonial goods, equalization of duties and imports, a halt on new duties or subsidies, and limited reform. In return, Ireland would have to contribute to the defense of the empire, but this was a non-starter for the Irish as it echoed proposals Britain had made to the American colonies a decade earlier. Nor did the Irish wish to end their own highly successful policy of providing manufacturing subsidies for textiles, gloves, and hats, glass, or their emerging sugar refining industry. At home in Britain, the General Chamber of Manufacturers had formed being perhaps the earliest expression of class solidarity amongst the emerging industrial capitalist entrepreneurs. Led by Josiah Wedgwood and Ironmaster Samuel Garbett, the Chamber had successfully lobbied for the repeal of the cotton tax in 1784. Now the manufacturers flooded Parliament with petitions in opposition to Pitt's proposed treaty with Ireland. 
while they were not opposed in principle to a mutual lowering of tariffs in the interest of expanding trade, they saw the treaty as granting favoritism to Ireland, which had ju been just been guaranteed major concessions during the American conflict and to Irish manufacturers. Noting Ireland's favorable conditions for manufacturing, lowering taxes, government inducements and bounties, and a plentiful supply of fast-flowing water, the manufacturer, Robert Peel, threatened, probably not seriously, to relocate his operation there should the treaty pass. The manufacturers also complained that they were losing workmen who were being lured away by the newly built Irish factories. The bill did offer much to landowners and little to manufacturers. Pitt and his ministers treated the manufacturers with condescension. The manufacturers therefore adopted a strategy of adding amendments that would ensure that it was no longer acceptable to the Irish Parliament. In this they succeeded. After his defeat, Pitt acted, acted with greater caution. Proposals for the United States in 1785-6 for a new commercial treaty with Britain were similarly rejected under the influence of ministers who saw adherence to the Navigation Acts, which they viewed as essential to Britain's prosperity. A commercial treaty with France, however, was signed in late 1786 and was strongly supported by the General Chamber of Manufacturers under Wedgwood's leadership. Critics among the manufacturers, however, charged that only the cotton, iron, and pottery industries were the beneficiaries. Industrial interests favored monopolistic policies. Feeling they had not been well represented, soon took charge of the chamber, which fell apart shortly thereafter. In Europe, a crisis erupted in Holland in the following year. Prussian troops invaded Holland in support of Frederick William II's sister, the Princess of Orange. Pitt subsequently forged a triple alliance between Britain, Prussia, and Holland. This temporarily erased French influence in Holland and convinced the Bourbons that Britain was an implacable enemy bent on the destruction of France. The move came at a moment of French weakness domestically and internationally, isolated in Western Europe and with Prussia seeking to preserve the balance of power in the East by limiting any territorial gains to be made by Russia or Austria after the recent outbreak of war with Turkey, France had few allies to turn to. Domestically, having overextended its finances in the American War, France was mired in insoluble debt and heading for bankruptcy. Half the crown's revenues were being expended on interest payments alone. Britain, meanwhile, was able to achieve its principal aim of limiting French influence in the Low Countries. And this included stemming a rebellion against Austrian rule in Belgium by prevailing upon the emperor to abandon an unpopular effort to rationalize and centralize the local administration in the Austrian Netherlands. Whether by luck or by skill, Pitt had achieved early success in foreign affairs, the field where he had the least experience. <laughs> Domestically, Pitt was also shoring up his position against the Foxite opposition when promotion of the boot legend was increasingly becoming irrelevant and whose alliance with the unpopular and flippant George Augustus, Prince of Wales, was increasingly becoming a liability. This liability was temporarily transformed into an opportunity during, during George III's sudden outbreak of madness from Porphyra in 1788. As Fox was holidaying with his mistress in Italy at the time, it fell on Sheridan to press for the prince to take over at once, at once as regent, offering Lord Thurlow the opportunity to remain at his post as Lord Chancellor in the event of a change of ministry. Rather than opposing the idea, Pitt called for a survey to determine what precedents had been set in the past and, based on its recommendations, sought to impose limitations on the regent's power and to enable Parliament to exercise sovereign authority in the absence of an acting king. When Fox pressed for greater powers for the regent, Pitt managed skillfully to divide the opposition over the issue of parliamentary authority. When George III subsequently recovered, the Foxites were divided and Pitt's authority was virtually unassailable. By the time of the, rev the revolution of 1789 broke out in France, Britain was enjoying the success of having simultaneously achieved the long-sought goals of political stability at home, a foreign policy that successfully checked French influence on the continent, 
and an unprecedented growth of foreign trade. Britons generally greeted the French Revolution with approval. The attitude of Pitt's ministry was one of, quote, condescension and complacency, end quote. It was assumed that the recently signed Eden Treaty could now be extended even further. Fox openly celebrated the fall of the Bastille. The Society for Commemorating the Revolution, later known as the Revolution Society, which a group of dissenters had formed in order to celebrate the centenary of the Glorious Revolution, greeted events in France as the serendipitous French equivalent. Footnote. The Society sent a congratulatory address to France in 1789 and, quote, urged that, quote, the fir two first kingdoms in the world, end quote, should together promote the common cause of freedom, end quote. End footnote. One of these dissenters, Reverend Dr. Richard Price, delivered an address to the Society in November of 1789, in which he not only lavished praise on the American and French revolutions as signs of the spread of Enlightenment principles, but also spoke of how the Glorious Revolution was incomplete, making a strong case that Britain had stood in need of reform. The sermon provoked Edmund Burke to respond with his essay Reflections on the Revolution in France, which quickly gained a wide audience and the endorsement of the king. Around 19,000 copies sold in the first year of its publication, and perhaps 30,000 in the five years to follow, Burke rejected the idea that the Glorious Revolution of 1688 had involved the same sharp break with past president, precedent, as appeared to be the case in, at present. In France, Price's sermon, he wrote, quote, is in a strain which I believe has not been heard in this kingdom since the year 1648, end quote, Burke. In Burke's view, Price willfully misinterpreted the events of 1688 in order to advance the proposition that the people of England had acquired and exercised the right to choose their own governors and frame their own government, or to, quote, cashier them for misconduct, end quote. Quote, footnote, quote, no government could stand a moment if it could be blown down by anything so loose and indefinite as an opinion of, quote, misconduct, end quote, end quote. Against such a right, Burke counterposed the long-standing practice of impeachment. While Burke was a staunch Whig, his defense of 1688 as generally a revolution which can serve the basic political framework of the English Constitution means his work is today treated as a care charter document of modern conservatism. End footnote. The act of the act of succession may have been a deviation from principle, but Price and his followers wrote Burke, quote, take the deviation from the principle for the principle itself, end quote. Burke saw the creation of the National Assembly out of the Third Estate as precisely such a repudiation of past principle and a dangerous irrigation and centralization of power by the revolutionaries. More than that, he uncannily predicted that the French Revolution would lead to tyranny, a rejection of Christianity in France, and a cataclysmic war in Europe. Burke's essay attracted many published responses. His critics attacked his romantic portrayal of the first monarchy and his seemingly undue pessimism in which he stood virtually alone. In the summer of 1791, Burke met with Pitt and warned that Britain stood on the brink of a crisis threatening all that had been since the Glorious Revolution. Pitt was not moved by the warning. During the debates concerning negotiations with Spain over Nootka Sound and settlement rights on the Pacific coast of North America, pro-French sympathizers among the opposition interpreted the lack of French support for Bourbon Spain as evidence that the new government in Paris had abandoned dynastic ambitions. <laughs> Pitt's Canada Act of 1791, by proposing special accommodations for Catholics and French Canadians, invited comparisons with revolutionary France. Sheridan and Gray went out of their way to provoke Burke, causing him to publicly distance himself from the Foxites during the subsequent debates in 1791, leaving the opposition in Parliament still weaker than before. <laughs> 
The pace of events seemed everywhere to quicken in the 1790s. Parliament was passing act after act, approving enclosures, new turnpike trusts, and other projects of, quote, improvement, end quote. Canal mania was in high gear, with huge sums being invested in multiple projects. Attention now turned to the task of completing Brindley's proposed, quote, Grand Cross, end quote, which would connect all parts of England and would incorporate London, the largest market of all, into the network. For the moment, traffic had to travel up the Thames to Oxford and north along the narrow Oxford Canal, a journey of 228 miles. Footnote. Prior to the opening of the Coventry and Birmingham and Faisley canals, the route between London and Birmingham was fully 280 miles. End footnote. To provide a better alternative, the Grand Union Canal was proposed in 1791, and an act of Parliament would authorize the scheme two years later. 1792 was a boom year for trade. The Foxite Whigs formed the Society for the Friends of the Peoples, ostensibly in hopes of shoring up support for themselves and for the French Revolution, but specifically in an effort to claim leadership over the reformist movement and outwit the radical element. But given that the society was, quote, unrepentantly aristocratic, end quote, it was quite unlikely that this effort would succeed in attracting working class adherents. Indeed, the London Corresponding Society was established soon after, itself comprising mainly artisans. While not denying that the London Corresponding Society was rooted in the, quote, working class, end quote, Thompson suggests that the organization may be better described as a, quote, popular radical, end quote, society. This appellation accurately places the descriptive emphasis on the political nature of the organization, for the primary goal of the LCS was political reform, with universal male suffrage being its key demand. This was indeed a demand that had scarcely been heard since 1648 in the wake of debates at Putney, and Burke had accurately forecast its formation. Political radicalism and reformism were not the only expressions of disaffection with the government, religious groups from Wesleyan congregations that had broke with mainstream Methodism to the followers of Richard Brothers, the millenarian prophet, quote, who saw the French revolutionaries striking down Babylon, end quote, also expressed dissent. <sighs> The French Revolution now breathed new life into the radical cause, for what sense could it possibly make that not only the former colonists in America, but now even the common people of France, long the symbol of papist despotism, enjoyed greater personal liberties than British subjects? Ever since the suppression of radicalism during the Civil War and the Interregnum, popular radical resistance was caught in a narrow channel. On the one hand, the state did not tolerate challenges to the social hierarchy. After 1660, it abandoned any attempts to restrict enclosures and grew increasingly lax on enforcing labor laws which enshrined custom. On the other hand, Customary law in both town and countryside countryside still existed. The Elizabethan statutes were still official policy and artisans could appeal to them, yet the ongoing commercialization of social relations through enclosures and concentration of manufacturing operations meant a steady wearing away of the force of custom. Two factors made the context of the 1790s entirely different from the 1640s. While First, while support for the radicals in the 1640s was drawn primarily from the London artisan community, the, spreading, the spread of cottage manufacturing and the growth of towns such as Manchester and Birmingham meant that there were now far more artisans and they were far more widely dispersed. Second, artisans in the 1790s, unlike those in the 1640s, faced an ominous threat to their livelihood. Were they able to achieve their reformist goals and gain the right to vote, they undoubtedly would have sought to use their newfound political power in an effort to protect themselves against exposure to the market and the growing factory system. <laughs>
Just one month following the publication of Burke's essay, Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman was published in December of 1790. It was perhaps the most radical of all the published responses. Casting Burke as the, quote, champion of property, end quote, passages of her wide-ranging essay echo the levelers of the Putney debates, if not Wynne Stanley and the Diggers. Quote, why cannot large estates be divided into small farms? These dwellings would indeed grace our land. Why are huge forests still allowed to stretch out with idle pomp and all the indolence of eastern grandeur? Why does the brown waste meet the traveler's view when men want work? But commons cannot be enclosed without acts of parliament to increase the property of the rich. Why might not the industrious peasant be allowed to steal a farm from the heath? This sight I have seen, the cow that supported the children grazed near the hut, and the cheerful poultry were fed by the chubby babes, who breathed a bracing air, far from the disease and vices of cities. Domination blast all of these prospects. Virtue can only flourish amongst equals. End quote. Footnote. Wollstonecraft's essay was shockingly irreverent for its time. Quote, it is impossible to read half a dozen pages of your book without admiring your ingenuity or indignantly spurning your sophisms. Words are heaped on words till the understanding is confused by endeavoring to disentangle the sense and the memory of tracing contradictions. End quote. Wollstonecraft. In Wollstonecraft's work, there is a mixture of fatalism and revulsion in reaction to the excesses of wealth being built up in the midst of distress and poverty that was surely widely felt. End footnote. Such an open attack on elite privilege and the sacredness of property was bound to cause excitement, but Wollstonecraft was attacked more on the basis of her being a woman than an orthodox per than an unorthodox personal life. Excuse me. But Wollstonecraft was attacked more on the basis of her being a woman with an unorthodox personal life than on the merit of her arguments. Thomas Paine's equally irreverent essay, The Rights of Man, the first part of which appeared in February of 1791, followed by the second part a year later, garnered far greater excitement by virtue of its extraordinary popularity. After the publication of the second part, Pitt began writing to ministers about the possibility of suspending habeas corpus and issuing legislation to suppress dissent. Where Wollstonecraft had attacked Burke's defense of property, Paine sought to challenge Burke's interpretation of the Glorious Revolution, suggesting that Burke's argument amounted to granting the dead, meaning the revolutionaries of 1688, a right to fix a political set settlement, quote, for all time, end quote, upon the living. Paine saw nothing, quote, glorious, end quote, about 1688 when set next to the revolutions in America and France. Quote, the very rights men and women now sought had not even been debated then, end quote. Footnote. Paine's essay was, quote, stridently egalitarian, anti-clerical, and quite original in its advocacy of redistributive taxation to finance public education and welfare, end quote. Hay and Rogers. Paine stopped short of advocating a redistribution of property, however. End footnote. Paine attacked the absurdities of the British electoral system. Quote, the town of Old Sorum, which contains not three houses, sends two members, and the town of Manchester, which contains upward of 60,000 souls, is not admitted to send any. Is there any principle in these things? End quote. Paine. By contrasting the evidently more equitable and rational representative systems of America and France with that of Britain, Paine advanced a powerful case for reform. At the same time, the secret to Paine's success, in 17, by 1793, radical societies had already sold between two and three hundred thousand copies of The Rights of Man, may be explained by the way he positioned himself alongside the advocates of Enlightenment progress, while simultaneously writing with enough wit, sarcasm, and humor to 
to appeal to a growing audience of literate commoners. Moderate reformers such as Christopher Wyville despaired at the popularity of these new voices as a resurgent radical of a resurgent radicalism, seeing in them the doom of any efforts for reform. In the short one, short run, Wyville was correct. When war in Europe broke out in April 1792, virtually no other Briton but Burke thought it would last very long. Upon introducing the budget in February, Pitt had conf confidently remarked that there had never been a time when, quote, quote, we might more reasonably expect 15 years of peace than we may at the present moment, end quote, end quote, as cited in Christie, 1982. On the 20th of April, France declared war against Austria over its leniency toward French emigres. Also factoring into the declaration of war were the demands by German princes in French-controlled Alsace for a restoration of their feudal privileges and status, prompting Frederick William II to join the war in aid of Austria and the German princes. In Britain, the declaration of war led to a war on the banks of and the shortage of cash in excuse me in britain the declaration of war led to a run on the banks and the shortage of cash in circulation was exposed this forced several country banks to stop payment on their notes sending a jolt through the financial system the french invasion of the austrian netherlands was routed with french soldiers defecting in large numbers at this stage, had Austria and Prussia not been entangled with Russia in a dispute over the disposition of territories in Poland, the revolution might have ended with a joint invasion by Austria and Prussia. Instead, the revolutionaries in France had time to contemplate what the division of Poland meant by way of an example. Faced with the prospect of an occupied France being dismantled and shared out by rival powers, the young republic, quote, discovered or invented total war, the total mobilization of a nation's resources through conscription, rationing, and a rigidly controlled war economy, and virtual abolition at home or abroad of the distinction between soldiers and civilians, end quote. Europe was about to embark upon nearly a quarter century of virtually uninterrupted war in which French armies would overrun the, quote, feudal, end quote, regimes of the continent. As it had done repeatedly since 1688, Britain would once more be called upon to dig deep into its agrarian capitalist pockets and subsidize the war effort against France. At home, the outbreak of, the, of hostilities on the continent served to cast a light of suspicion upon reformists and supporters of the revolution in France. Alarmed at the popularity of Paine's rights of man, the government charged Paine with sedition. In August, Thomas Hardy and friends published an address to the people promising, quote, Dimin taxes diminished, the necessaries of life more within the reach of the poor, youth better educated, prisons less crowded, and old age better provided for, end quote. The artisan outlook of the address is unmistakable. Briggs comments, quote, They thus pointed the way forward to the development of workmen's politics in the 19th century, particularly to Chartism, end quote. Payne appeared in court on the 8th of June, 1792, only to have the trial postponed. Payne was granted French citizenship and was elected to Fort de Partement in the convention. On 14th of September, Payne departed for France. A fresh warrant for his arrest arrived at Dover only 20 minutes after Payne's ship set sail. Footnote. In July, Payne was considered going, excuse me, in July, Payne had considered going to Dublin, where he had been elected a member of the United Irishmen. Payne never returned to England. The convention in France had recently replaced the National Assembly. <laughs> End footnote. 
In a letter published after his departure, he broke, quote, from his previous strategy as well as his moderate associates and argued that a British convention should assemble to abolish the monarchy, end quote. Clays. Such a call for popular democratic insurrection helped to galvanize elites in Britain behind a campaign of reaction and repression. Further inflaming these tensions, France declared the Edict of Fraternity in November, reserving the right to come to the aid of, quote, subject peoples, and quote, struggling for liberty and against despotism. In December, with the King of France on trial for treason and false rumors circulating of an impending rising in Britain, the lawyer John Rees founded the Association for the Preservation of Liberty and Property against Republicans and Levelers, the most prominent in a wave of Loyalist associations that began to form across Britain. The Loyalists focused their efforts on detecting and prosecuting, quote, subversive, end quote, authors using tactics of threats and intimidation. Nominal membership in Loyalist organizations was high, but given the climate of intimidation and levels of surveillance that were used to pressure citizens to join regardless of their true loyalties, the depths of genuine support is impossible to gauge. Tactics involved, quote, beatings, inquisitions, sackings, and ostracism, end quote. Emsley. 1985. There were many examples. To take one that speaks to the dynamics of agrarian capitalist social relations, quote, the Quaker John Payne of New Hill was warned by Earl Fitzwilliam in 1792 that his involvement with the bracket radical end bracket Sheffield Society for Constitutional Information might cost him the tenancy of his farm, end quote. The loyalists, uh, Elmsley. Elmsley, 1985. It's Elmsley, not Elmsley. The Loyalist Society's attack on freedom of expression prompted the formation of the Friends of Liberty of the Press a year later, which counted 20 opposition MPs amongst its members. Footnote. Among these MPs were Samuel Whitbread and Thomas Erskine, Outside Parliament, such reformists as John Thelwall, Major John Cartwright, and John Horne Took were active members. Reeves' Loyalist Association was not the first. The Church and King Club, formed in Manchester in 1790, was later superseded by the Association for Preserving Constitutional Order in late 1792. Links were formed with local authorities and, quote, mob and, quote, violence against reformers was encouraged. Birmingham had seen, quote, church and king and, quote, disturbances in July of 1791 and similar disturbances took place in Manchester in June and December of 1792. End footnote. Britain was not yet at war with France, but the French Revolution had already set in motion the forces of counter-revolution within Britain. This meant that resistance in the form of protests against enclosures or machine-breaking was also cast in the light of suspicion, more so the activities of, quote, combinations, end quote, among workers. Strikes were becoming increasingly common, and 1792 was the year that the term, quote, scab, end quote, made its first appearance. Footnote. The racially charged label, quote, blackleg, end quote, appears to have already come into existence by this time, and hearing for the consolid in hearings for the consideration of a bill against combinations in papermaking in 1796, employers reported that a refusal to raise wages by five shillings per week had, quote, provoked a strike amongst the men who were supported, it was said, from a general fund and who took action against, quote, blacklegs, end quote, amongst whom were men from north of England and from Scotland, end quote, Coleman, 1954, with the brief institution, a union of cloth dressers, quote, the threat of blacklegs was largely obviated by the high-skilled nature of a cloth dresser's work and because, the establishment of the brief institution extended union influence nationally, end quote. End footnote. At Leeds and West Riding, the cloth merchants announced their interest, to me, their intention to introduce machinery in a public manifesto, and quote, more than one Leeds mill was destroyed by croppers in the next ten years, end quote. Thompson, 1798-1801. 
A government official in Scotland observed that, quote, quote, the spirit of insubordination increases with the increase of manufacture, end quote, end quote, Thompson. In the west of England, where, quote, food riots, end quote, were particularly common, large crowds protested against the introduction of the scribbling engine and the shuttle loom in the early 1790s. The outbreak of machine breaking probably served to heighten tensions over the perceived threat of Jacobinism. But, amongst, but among artisans, the government's campaign of repression also compounded hostility towards the introduction of machinery, the threat of factories, and violations of the Tudor statuses. Excuse me, stu- Tudor statutes. The government's attention turned to the friendly societies, which were appreciated for their work in providing a kind of welfare for the sick, the elderly, and the unemployed, thereby freeing the ratepayer of an enormous burden. Numbering on average between 100 and 200 members, they had come to be less associated with particular trades and more closely identified with the local community. Their growth since they first began to emerge in the 1690s, and especially since mid-century was phenomenal, rising to some 7,200 by 1801, with 648,000 members, only the churches enjoyed larger followings. Rule 1986. In the context of the threat of Jacobinism, their growing numbers aroused suspicion. Quote, Those advising the government, even the liberal-minded Sir Frederick Eden, felt that many of the friendly societies, with their passwords, loyalty oaths, and their drinking habits, were breeding grounds for rebellion, offering, in the words of the Board of Agriculture in 1793, quote, commodious opportunities to foment sedition, end quote, end quote. In an effort to bring regulation to this sphere of social activity, in 1793, an act was passed to encourage the friendly societies through regulation. But fearing persecution and a seizure of their funds, nearly a quarter of them refused to register. Having found documents that proved conclusively that Louis XVI had conspired to encourage a foreign invasion of France, a majority of the convention in Paris voted in favor of his execution, which took place on the 21st of January 1793. Pitt took this as a pretext to expel France's diplomatic representative, and in February the convention responded with a declaration of war against Britain and Holland. Pitt was aware that war would mean abandoning most of his program of reform. He thus held out for peace as long as possible. It would also mean a serious delay in securing the abolition of the slave trade, a cause Pitt supported. Footnote. In 1787, Granville Sharp had formed the Abolitionist Society in 1788 under the influence of his eloquent friend, William Wilberforce. Pitt introduced a motion to set up an inquiry into the slave trade. End footnote. It was thanks in large part to Pitt's financial and administrative reforms that Britain was in a far stronger position to engage in a war than it had been in 1783. Nevertheless, the Navy had only 16,000 sailors in uniform, down from 100,000 at the close of the American War. The Army had only 13,000 soldiers in uniform, even with the addition of the usual Hanoverian and Hessian mercenaries operating under British pay. This was clearly no match for the Army itself, excuse me, for the Army of half a million men that France was raising through the Vive in mass. The only conceivable strategy for Britain, now questionably the wealthiest power in Europe, was to return to the policy of raising, quote, gold, end quote, to offer subsidies to its allies. By the summer, Pitt, quote, had agreed to subsidize Austria, Prussia, Sardinia, Spain, and Naples on condition that they abandon the unrealistic aim of a Bourbon restoration, end quote. Christie, 1982. The national debate had been lowered to 200 and, excuse me the national debt had been lowered to 228 million pounds but soon Pitt would be faced with a war expenditure of 50 million pounds per annum. <laughs>
By now, the French were quite accustomed to the British policy of waging war against France through subsidies and mercenaries. The Girondists, who had been forced by the mountain to consent to the execution of the king, were no less radical when it came to speeches against their common English enemies. On the 13th of January, 1793, the Girondists, Armand de Cursain, complained how England could be defeated, excuse me, explained how England could be defeated. Quote, the credit of England rests upon fictitious wealth. The riches of that people are scattered everywhere. Bounded in territory, the public future of England is found almost wholly in its bank, and this edifice is entirely supported by the wonderful activity of their naval commerce. Asia, Portugal, and Spain are the most advantageous markets for the production of English industry. We should shut these markets to the English by opening to the world. End quote. Armand de Cursain. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. A-R-M-A-N-D-D-E-K-E-R-S-A-I-N-T. The Treaty of 1786, which had served the southern wine growers well, but which was despised by the northern manufacturers faced with the competition of a flood of cheap British goods, was now seen by the revolutionaries in Paris as merely part of a conspiracy by Pitt to bankrupt the French. As we shall see, the mistaken conception held by many Frenchmen that England's prosperity was based upon the, quote, fictitious wealth, end quote, of its colonial trade would ultimately bear bitter fruit for revolutionary France and for its manufacturers in particular. What Pitt did not have to face was a serious challenge to his authority to prosecute the war. Events in France were helping to solidify nationalist sentiment in British public opinion. War with France quickly became the national cause. Repression and loyalist intimidation served to marginalize dissent. Parliament was in no mood for reform. As Gray found out when his reform bill was roundly defeated in May 1793, Lord Braxfield felt secure enough to comment that, quote, quote, the landed air interest alone has a right to be represented, bracket and, end bracket, as for the rabble who have nothing but personal property, what hold has the nation on them, end quote. As quoted in Briggs, 1979. British reformers were asking just this question when they convened the British Convention of the Delegates of the People in Edinburgh in, eight, in October 1793. Fiery speeches were heard for a fortnight before authorities shut down the convention. Leaders were prosecuted, some convicted and transported. This provoked the English radical societies into outright defiance. In January, a full meeting of the LCS was held, at which it was resolved that, quote, quote, upon the first introduction of any bill or motion inimical to the liberties of the people, a general convention of the people should be summoned, end quote, end quote, as quoted in Christie, 1982. The Constitutional Information Society letter led the veteran Wilkite Horn Took went further and began planning for a convention. The Pitt government had seen enough. Had not the King of France been executed by another convention just the previous year? On the 12th of May, 1794, a committee of secrecy was appointed to draft a report, and two of the most prominent rabble-rousers were arrested, Thomas Hardy, shoemaker and founder of the LCS, and Daniel Adams, secretary of the Society for Constitutional Information. Four days later, the committee issued its report recommending the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, referring to the plan to summon a convention, quote, quote, an open, as, quote, quote, an open attempt to supersede the House of Commons in its representative capacity, end quote, end quote. Footnote, quote, few were aware, end quote, writes Emsley, quote, of the legal niceties which left queries over who could issue writs of habeas corpus, end quote, or that individuals imprisoned by order of parliament could not apply for the writ. Quote, 
yet whatever the limits of the legislation, belief in its potency was strong, end quote. Habeas had previously been suspended during the Jacobite emergencies in the American War. End footnote. These arrests were later followed by the arrest of John Horne Took, the poet and peace advocate John Thelwall, and ten other leading reformers. All were charged with treason. Their papers were seized, and the Committee of Secrecy sought evidence to be used against them. An orchestrated propaganda campaign employing newspapers and ballad singers on street corners promoted the idea that the arrested had been involved in a Jacobin plot to overthrow the government. The London Corresponding Society responded by establishing a secret executive committee, a September meeting of which was intruded upon by the Bow Street, the Bow Street Runners, who arrested the acting secretary. Footnote. The brainchild of novelist Henry Fielding, the Bow Street Runners, initially numbered eight men when they were set up in 1749, as chief magistrate, Fielding employed them to apprehend criminals nationwide. They operated out of this, his office at Number 4 Bow Street. John Fielding succeeded his brother as chief magistrate in 1754 and maintained the force. The increasing incidences of highway robbery prompted Fielding in 1757 to propose a light cavalry to pursue highwaymen. An act of 1792 established seven additional offices for the runners. Shootings of Bow Street runners became common, and those found guilty were hung in chains. Bow Street, quote, was the embryo of Scotland Yard. In 1798, crime on the Thames resulted in the establishment of the River Police following the proselytizing work of Patrick Calcoon, end quote who had acknowledged his debt to the Fieldings. The Bow Street Station closed in 1993, and the neighboring Bow Street Court closed in 2006. End footnote. The members, the member of the committee who was most strongly, pro, most strongly protested against the arrest was one, quote, Citizen Groves, end quote. Sensing a betrayer in their presence, Groves was accused of being a spy and was subjected to a formal trial before the full general committee of the London Corresponding Society. Satisfied with the evidence Groves presented of his devotion to the society, he was, quote, triumphantly acquitted, end quote. However, quote, quote, Citizen Groves, end quote, was, in fact, a spy. After each meeting of the secret executive, his full reports came in for the pursuit of Pitt on D or Dundas or the Treasury Solicitor. It is only thanks to his peculiar skill that we are able to describe the events of these months at all, end quote. End quote. No, this, no there's just one end quote. Thompson. In October, the trial of Hardy attracted national attention. A large crowd gathered outside the Old Bailey. A guilty verdict was sure to provoke a violent demonstration of protest. Hardy was acquitted to the celebration of the crowns. By December, Took, Thelwall, and other arrestees were acquitted as well to the deep embarrassment of Pitt's government. But this would be the, quote, last great victory of English civil liberties for many years, end quote, followed by decades of, quote, profound alienation between classes in Britain, end quote. Thompson. Footnote. The full quote reads as follows, quote, In the decades after 1795, there was a profound alienation between classes in Britain, and working people were thrust into a state of apartheid whose effects in the niceties of social and educational discrimination can be felt to this day. The, quote, natural, end quote, alliance between an impartial, excuse me, between an impatient, radically-minded industrial bourgeoisie and a formative proletariat was broken as soon as it was formed, end quote. End footnote. In February, the suspension of habeas corpus was renewed for another six months. Then in July, as thousands of French citizens were being marched to the guillotine in the terror, the Home Office would come to be occupied by the Duke of Portland, who, being disgusted with the Foxites' tolerance for revolutionary activity at, home, of activity at home and abroad, had finally decided to split with Fox and his followers and join Pitt. Pitt, quote, could not have found more zealous an advocate of a crackdown on radicalism, end quote. Maury, 1997. By June, as France was retaking Belgium at the Battle of 
Fluris, its first major victory of the war, the Commons Secret Committee in Britain reported on a plot to overthrow the government. The Foxites derided the report, refusing to believe, quote, that, quote, 18 pikeheads, 10 battle axes, and 20 blades unfurnished, end quote, amounted to a national conspiracy, end quote. But Portland believed that his spies had successfully infiltrated the, quote, military, end quote, wing of the London Corresponding Society and had foiled the plot. In October 1795, the LCS was able to gather a crowd of 15,000 for the opening day of Parliament. Whilst en route to Westminster, George III's coach was subsequently mobbed by an angry crowd. Their cries of, quote, bread, end quote, suggested that their protest was motivated by hunger, but Portland suspected Jacobinism. The swift response was the Seditious Meetings Act of 1795, imposing restrictions on meetings of more than 50 people, and the Treasonable Practices Act, which expanded the definition of treason to incorporate plots to harm the king, plots to foster foreign invasion, or the use of coercive language against Parliament. Only the former was ever put into effect. Against the Foxites, excuse me, again the Foxites reacted with ridicule, charging the government with intimidating its critics in the name of national security. The number of political prosecutions between 1793 and 1800 fell short of 200, most of these having been carried out by 1795. Scores more were held in prison without trial, provoking deep resentment. Quote, reformers directly affected by repression would not have agreed that there was no reign of terror, and there were enough people held in prison without trial whose health, reputation, and livelihood were harmed by arrest and trial for a reign of terror to become embedded in the developing radical consciousness, end quote. Turner, 1999. Pitt's attack on English liberties earned him comparisons with Robespierre, which, though ludicrous, were also within the compass of, quote, good and traditional political propaganda, end quote. Emsley, 1985. The arrest of Jacobites in 1715, 1722, and 1745 had been far more severe. The logic of imposing repressive legislation against workers who had no say in the making of that legislation meant that those same workers would ultimately demand the right to vote in order that they might one day change it. Radicalism based on the recognition of the need for fundamental change is by definition a form of resistance not just not against excuse me, against not just coercive repression but also hegemony. Since Britain's radical movement in the late 18th and early 19th centuries was made up of working people, resisting hegemony also became an exercise in class self-definition, even if the, quote, class, end quote, in question was not well developed and was led by artisans in possession of their own means of production, not feeling the full exposure to the market as wage laborers working on capitalist farms and in capitalist factories. Moreover, as the bonds of mutuality had once obligated both patricians and plebs to observe custom and paternalistic deference were in decline, including the protections and perquisites previously afforded by custom, artisans and laborers were compelled to strengthen horizontal bonds between them in the interest of protecting themselves against repression and, in the context of capitalism, against exposure to the market. Quote, you offer no motives, end quote. Outdoor relief and the problem of the poor. As we have seen, by the late 18th century, Britain ceased to be an exporter and was now an importer of grain. The primary reason for this was the extraordinary growth of population from the middle of the century onwards, itself in part a result of the major advances in agrarian productivity. <laughs> 
the emergence of fa the factory system and the application of new machinery such as the flying shuttle and the spinning jenny to domestic manufacturing enabled the textile industry to respond positively and swiftly to rising levels of demand. The poor harvest of 1794 and 1795, however, made it apparent that Britain faced a chronic food shortage problem. Britain's new reliance on food imports was seen as a dangerous policy in a time of war. Wartime inflation combined with shortages of grain drove the price of wheat to previously unseen heights. Quote, 108 shillings a quarter in London, 160 shillings in Leicester, while in many places it was unobtainable, end quote. Thompson. In Berkshire, the justices of the peace met an in, at an inn in Speenhamland in May of 1795 to discuss how to respond to the shortage of grain. They introduced a schedule for supplementing wages in accordance with the price of bread, effectively setting a minimum income for poor and working families in their country. Subsequently, their schedule was widely adopted in variations with variations across England. Historians are still debating the effect of this adoption of the, quote, Spean Hamland system, end quote. In The Great Transformation, Karl Polanyi makes Spean Hamland a key component of his account of the origins of the free labor market. By this point in time, argues Polanyi, a free market in land and in money had largely been established, but not in labor. Polanyi interprets Spean Hamland as an unconscious attempt by the landed classes in England to preserve paternalism and forestall the emergence of proletarianization and a free labor market. The decision to supplement wage rates, quote, amounted to the abandonment of Tudor legislation, not for the sake of less, but of more paternalism, end quote. According to Polanyi, despite their best humanitarian intentions, the justices of Berkshire had invented a system that, once in unhindered by Speenhamland, would now would lead to an overall decline in labor productivity, a fall in wages to a level below that of subsistence, the difference being made up by relief, and a delay in the, demur in the emergence of a free market in labor that would ultimately allow for overall wealth and incomes to rise. While the burden of rising rates fell on the yeoman tenant farmer, this was excuse me, partially offset by low wages and free labor organized through the roundsman system, which allowed employers to forego paying the rates if they employed laborers making, quote, the rounds, end quote, in search of employment. While Polanyi offers a contradiction to his thesis when he argues that had agricultural laborers been allowed to form legal combinations, the effect of the system might have been to increase wages, whereby at least suggest excuse me, thereby at least suggesting that the true cause of rural immiseration was the combinations acts. Polanyi nevertheless places the blame more or less squarely on the quote ambiguous humanitarianism end quote of the Spean Hamlin system, the quote supreme abomination end quote of which he argued was to artificially reduce the worker to the status of a pauper. Footnote. Earlier, Polanyi seems to suggest that this is someone else's argument, but not his own, when he writes, quote, the inexplicable increase in the number of the poor was almost generally put down to the method of poor law administration and not without some good cause, end quote. Continuing, Polanyi suggests a deeper cause, quote, actually beneath the surface, the growth of rural pauperism was directly linked with the trend of general economic history, end quote. Well, general trend, what general trend is he talking about? He points to a, quote, increase in what we would today call invisible unemployment, end quote, that resulted from fluctuations in trade. Quote, much of the social damage done in England's, to England's countryside sprang at first from the dislocating effects of trade directly upon the countryside itself. The revolution in agriculture definitely antedated the Industrial Revolution, end quote. On that, we all agree. End footnote. According to Polanyi, Spean Hamland was a reversal of the equally humanitarian intent of the relief behind the Poor Act of 1782. Gilbert's Act, which had expanded the scale of relief to the able-bodied poor, this act had been undertaken for two reasons. 
the humanitarian element recognized that workhouses were best suited to attending to the needs of the orphans, invalids, the sick, and elderly. As many parishes struggled to build or maintain effective workhouses, these were now to be organized on a collective basis by grouping parishes together to build common workhouses. The pragmatic element of Gilbert's act was a recognition that a, as workhouses could not be made to become self-sustaining, it would be cheaper to provide, quote, outdoor relief, end quote, to able-bodied poor in their own homes than to provide, quote, indoor relief, end quote, in workhouses. Samuel Whitbread Jr., son of the famous brewer, introduced a bill in the winter of 1795 proposing that the statute of apprentices be expanded to include, quote, the fixing of minimum wages by yearly assessment, end quote. Footnote. The following year in the Commons, Whitbread and Pitt debated the particulars of their respective bills designed to address the distress of the poor. Sir Frederick Eden opposed Whitbread's minimum wage, but also felt that Pitt's measures went too far. In his essay, quote, On the State of the Poor, end quote, in 1797, Sir Frederick Eden spoke specifically of the, quote, laboring class, end quote, which should benefit from the reform of the poor law, but might become less industrious with an increase in relief. End footnote. Setting a minimum wage, writes Polanyi, ran contrary to the intent behind the partial lifting of the provisions tying laborers to their native parish under the Act of Settlement of 1662, the intent being to allow wages to find their, quote, natural, end quote, level according to the market. Aid in wages did not run counter to this intent. It merely enabled the, quote, natural price, end quote, excuse me, the, quote, natural, end quote, price of labor to fall below subsistence levels due to their being supplemented out of the poor rates. In 1796, the option of setting a minimum wage was bypassed when Parliament adopted the speen hamlin system. Two decades after the publication of The Great Transformation, Mark Blog, or Blaug, who I think is like a historian of economic thought, I'm not exactly sure, um, argue that the common interpretation of Spienhamlin and the old poor law is stifling the emergence of free labor and acting not to raise the living standards of the poor, but rather to trap the poor in a, quote, vicious spiral, end quote, of increasing poverty resulted from the uncritical adoption of the views expressed in the Poor Law Commissioner's Report of 1834, which, quote, has seriously distorted the history of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, end quote, and was both ahistorical and based on evidence consisting of, quote, little more than picturesque anecdotes of maladministration, end quote. What one takes away from the work of Blog and others critical of the report like the, and those like Polanyi who have repeated its arguments is, first of all, the degree of oversimplification behind the, quote, snowball effect, end quote, argument that aid in wages set in train a, quote, vicious spiral, end quote, of soaring poor rates and progressively increasing poverty. For one thing, the methods and the goals the methods and goals applied to the administration of the poor law were subject to serious regional differences and differences across time. Quote, with a system so heterogeneous, any generalization is bound to be subject to serious qualification. End quote. Blog. This is the key weakness behind both the report and Polanyi's account, is a problem of economic theory in general, that of making arguments in the abstract without historicizing arguments and with a limited range of variables. For Blaug, the resultant population growth from subsidies may contribute to a long-term decline in wages, but in the short term, the, quote, effect of a subsidy to workers is to lessen the supply, end quote. And, quote, if the supply curve of labor is positively sloped, the result is that wages will rise, end quote. Footnote, this according to Blaug is, quote, elementary economics, end quote. End footnote. Polanyi recognizes this tendency but sees the issue not as one of supply but rather one of allowing workers to combine and struggle for higher wages. Polanyi otherwise appears to take at face value the notion that aid in wages will depress wages overall. What Blaug 
adds to the discussion in his effort to expose the myth of the old poor law as historical context. He points out, first of all, that by the time of the report, the prescription of outdoor relief in 1834, the Spean-Hamlin system had largely been abandoned. Plotting the available statistics for poor relief between 1802 and 1834, Blaug demonstrates that there was little difference in the overall levels of poor relief in counties where the Spean Hamblin system was widely used and those where it was not, and between agricultural versus non agricultural counties. Neither differences in the administration of poor relief nor the quote alleged deterioration of agriculture under the influences of allow the influence of allowances and aid of wages, end quote provide any, quote, evidence whatever, end quote, to support the, quote, snowball effect, end quote, theory claiming that wage subsidies exacerbated the perennial agrarian distress from 1795 to 1834. Footnote. Rule notes that in many counties, when prices approached famine levels, the authorities would purchase large amounts of grain and resell them in the, to the poor below market prices. This was another form of providing relief in the form of a subsidy distinct from aid in wages. Might this help explain why Blaug found little variation between Spean-Hamland and non-Spean-Hamland counties? This seems doubtful if the method was, as described, only a temporary emergency measure. Aid in wages under the Spean-Hamland system was also initiated as an emergency measure meant to be temporary, but it quickly became perennial, at least in certain counties. End footnote. Blau's statistics do confirm that rates were generally higher in certain counties, mainly in the southeast, where the Spean-Hamlin system was also applied. His interpretation of the Spean-Hamlin system is that it was a fairly rational solution to the problem of chronic unemployment in regions where wages were substandard. An example of this was the corresponding roundsman system, which was used to provide farm work during summers and winters when the demand for agrarian labor was low. Blaug also makes the obvious argument that supplementing wages meant supplementing diets, which could allow for a higher calorie intake by workers and thus translate into greater productivity. Certainly, once established, a withdrawal of aid in wages could threaten the sheer physical output of those workers. According to Larry Patriquin, Contemporaries hardly saw Spean-Hamlin as a landmark policy. The practice of topping up wages with poor rates has been increased increasing since the 1770s. The fame of Spean-Hamlin, quote, lies in the fact that the Berkshire, quote, bread scale, end quote, was published and became relatively well known, end quote. To this, we must add the international political context of a war with France, which reduced the landowners of England and Wales to, quote, quietly accepting, end quote, the addition of some 100,000 more able-bodied men to the total number of those receiving poor relief. By 1802, that total included more than one in every ten persons in England and Wales. This acceptance can only be understood in light of the perceived threat of domestic Jacobinism amidst flagging support for the war effort. The fact that the consensus on providing such relief fell apart at the conclusion of hostilities with France in 1815 would appear to confirm this link. This vast expansion of outdoor relief and the soaring rates were eventually bound to bring about a response from those who took away the impression that the underlying problem was idleness. It seems, however, that the underlying problem was lack of employment. So what was the cause of such high rates of unemployment in agrarian regions? Snell's work demonstrates that demonstrates an 83% correlation between the enclosures and variations in poor relief. Quote, enclosure, end quote, writes Rule, quote, may not have been the only or even the most potent of the forces increasing and impoverishing the proletariat in the southern and midland counties, but it was important in bringing many to a total wage dependency, end quote. Rule, 1992. 
In the South and East, another likely factor was the decline of rural textile manufacturing. Other factors promoting proletarianization cited by rule are the spread of wheat growing, which demanded less year-round labor, and the decline in boarded farm servants, which Spean Hamlin facilitated by subsidizing labor and thus making wage labor cheaper than the cost of maintaining borders. Patriquin argues that the modifications to the system of poor relief represented by Spean Hamlin amount to a response to a, quote, crisis of capitalist agriculture, end quote. He points out that under the manorial system, lords had commandeered labor for work on these domain lands, D-E-M-E-S-N-E, lands during periods of the highest demand, such as harvest time, <coughs> while the rest of the year peasants were able to focus on farming their own holdings. With the breaking of the customary agricultural practices of the manor through enclosures, such extra economic exploitation of labor was no longer possible. Thus, the roundsman system and other methods of putting the unemployed to work not only had an Histor had a historical antecedent, but like the poor laws, which Patroquin sees as an early system of welfare cushioning the effects of the introduction of agrarian capitalism, such modes of labor organization provided an additional means of buffering the dislocation of labor being divorced from access to land and rights of commons by the final wave of parliamentary enclosures, with the added shocks of wartime inflation and poor harvests. The crisis in question was fundamentally one of widespread and increasing poverty resulting from increasing market dependency combined with a want of employment. Rule may be correct in surmising that enclosures as such might not have been the quote most potent end quote cause of poverty, but enclosures were only one very important form of change in a broader process by which the land was commodified and the population was rendered market dependent. The conversion from customary to market regulation of the economy to capitalism was the broader process that enabled some to rapidly accumulate wealth whilst others lapsed into poverty. It should be made quite clear that if there was a crisis of agrarian capitalism, it did not mean a crisis for farmers holding roughly 100 acres or more. Wartime inflation meant high prices and high profits. The farmer's cry of distress in these years had not to do with lost profits, but with soaring poor rates and for those who were struck with occasional crop failure. For the successful tenant farmer, it was a time of excitement and opportunity as new lands such as waste and commons were brought into cultivation and markets widened. In the interest of promoting New techniques in farming, the semi-official Board of Agriculture was established in 1793 with Arthur Young as its secretary. Quote, this curious body, end quote, writes Plum, quote, had no bureaucratic function or authority, end quote. Plum, 1963. What stimulation was needed when Parliament was rubber stamping each enclosure act? Poverty was one of the three great questions occupying the minds of the thinkers of the day, the others being population and education. As Polanyi points out, contemporaries everywhere were befuddled to answer the question, where do the poor come from? Some earnestly suggested that the principal culprit was the consumption of tea. In 1796, the same year as the Board of Health was established to deal with a rash of fever in the aftermath of two failed harvests and localized famine, the Society for the Bettering of the Conditions of the Poor was established for the purpose of turning charity into a science. Reverend Malthus was still at this time preparing the manuscript of his famous essay on population, which would announce his discovery of the principle that poverty resulted from the geometric progression of population outstripping the arithmetic growth of the food supply. His puerile discovery would occupy the minds engaged in polite discourse on the, quote, problem of the poor, end quote, for a generation. For the wealthy, it was only too convenient to assume that poverty simply arises from a lack of innovative, excuse me, a lack of initiative and not exploitation and unemployment. It was perhaps easier for the poor to grasp the true nature of the problem, quote, quote, you offer no motives, end quote, end quote. A pauper is said to have exclaimed to Arthur Young, quote, quote, you have nothing but a parish officer and a workhouse. Bring me another pot, end quote, end quote. Footnote. 
Malthus's essay would play an important role in prompting Parliament to pass the Census Act in 1800. The resultant census, census of 1801 would reveal that England and Wales had a combined population of 8.9 million, up from an estimated 6 million in 1700 and 6.5 million in 1750. Scotland was revealed to have 1.6 million people living there. No census was taken in Ireland. The numbers revealed that the population was in fact growing rapidly. The early censuses were not thorough, and only from the late 1830s do we have good statistical data on British demographics. End footnote. Another reverend, Reverend Davies of Berkshire, wrote of poverty, quote, Hope is cordial, of which the poor man has especially much need to cheer his heart in the toilsome journey through life, and the fateful consequences of that policy which deprives laboring people of the expectation of possessing any property in the soil, might be the extinction of every generous principle in their minds, end quote. To Davies, the plight of the poor was not the consequence of defects of character, but defects of character, the consequence of poverty, most of his suggestions for alleviating that poverty, however, were relentlessly disposed of by Malthus, for whom official action was more likely to increase poverty than, poverty than to make it more tolerable. End quote. Sheffield, page 60, citing Davies, 1795. Malthus, for his part, did not believe that the poor rates contributed significantly to the increase of population as many others did. End footnote. It would, of course, be a gross exaggeration to suggest, based on B Mark Blaug's argument, that aid and wages did not contribute to the slightest degree, in the slightest degree, to the demoralization of workers and to shoddy work. What Blaug convincingly refuted was the assumption upon which the poor law commissioners of 1834 based their recommendations, that aid and wages worsened poverty. During the three decades leading up to that point, there must have been more Reverend Davies's at the local level than there were Reverend Malthus's. Conclusion The process we are describing here is in a very real sense one of local custom being supplanted by state law. Specifically, by asserting absolute property rights under the common law, British landlords and capitalists were uprooting the local foundations of customary law in the form of the village court leet and its jurisdiction over local tenures and, and common right, and in the form of a wide variety of normative modes of organizing labor, many that had existed since time out of mind. This process, as we have seen, has been developing over centuries, but parliamentary enclosures now represented the move to effect a wholesale conversion from a society of self-subsistent peasant agriculturalists and independent craftsmen to one based on the exploitation of market-dependent wage laborers. The conversion involved more than just the supplanting of customary of custom by law. The spirit of custom could not be exercised through legislation alone. Custom is rooted not only in local laws and bylaws, but also in culture and ideology, and these forms would prove resilient even after the laws that enshrined normative beliefs and practices were abolished. A new order required a new ideological push, a coherent body of thought capable of delegitimizing and even criminalizing such time-honored customary forms as the, quote, food riot, end quote, quote, takings, end quote, and restrictions on forestalling and regrading, these elevating, excuse me, whilst elevating absolute property rights as the highest social value. <laughs> We have placed considerable stress on the Gordon riots because, in many ways, the logic of how this upheaval in London played out mirrored the logic of a myriad of smaller conflicts at the village and town level, where custom played a central role. While, when faced with a disappointing response from Parliament to their peaceful protest, the reaction of the London crowd was generally within the bounds of what had long been considered a customarily acceptable level of violence. Thank <laughs> you.
But the overwhelming use of deadly force to put down the protest signaled that the old reciprocities had broken down, symbolically at least being bringing closure to a process that had started 65 years earlier when the English crowd was criminalized as a, quote, mob with the passage of the Riot Act. <sighs> Thus, when the unanticipated revolution in France reverberated throughout British society, the Hanoverian regime was itself in the midst of a crisis of legitimacy, one whose origins were entirely different from that facing the Bourbons. If the initial burst of enthusiasm for Jacobinism in Britain spelled prospects for revolution at home, the onset of war quickly dampened them by obliging Britons to show their patriotism and rally to the national cause. The combined effects of dearth, the loss of overseas trade due to war and large-scale unemployment in the countryside meant that conditions were harsh and ripe for protest, but as repression set in and radical leaders were arrested, protesters in general were increasingly treated as though they were part and parcel of the political movement that was radicalism. Under the Spean-Hamlin system's provision of outdoor relief, the poor rates soared, buffering untold numbers of rural dwellers from starvation. Despite cries of distress at the high rates from landowners, and tenant farmers, high prices for grain products during the war meant relative prosperity for owners and employers. But for agrarian laborers more than any other social group, it was the onset of a period of dire distress. As the vast majority of them were now rendered largely, if not wholly, market-dependent, attention turned to the laws that continued to shield domestic manufacturing workers from full exposure to the market. End of chapter 10. Thank <laughs> you.